At the beginning of 2010, BioWare released what many regard as the developer's greatest game. Well, depending on who you ask. For the longest time, though, I was one of those people who believed that Mass Effect 2 was BioWare's magnum opus. I played through it twice before the third game came out, and then I never played it again. This actually wasn't Mass Effect 2's fault as much as it was the third game's ending which ruined it for me. Much like I have no desire to rewatch Game of Thrones, the infamous three-button ending crippled my view of the series permanently. Still, I would always regard Mass Effect 2 as the best one. But at this stage, I have to wonder if my lower standards back then blinded me to the game's shortcomings, or if it truly holds up as an untouchable beacon of sci-fi storytelling. So in this video, I want to play through the game and give my feedback on its mechanics, its setting, its character backgrounds, and most importantly, its story. So we do have an issue with choosing the version that we're going to play. Since the Legendary Edition released this year, I've been debating whether or not to run with that or to boot up the older version. I mean, in all fairness, the video's titled what it's titled. But if you've watched any of my other videos, you'll know that I don't give a shit about graphics beyond the occasional compliment if something wows me. So what's changed beyond these graphical upgrades? Well, not much in regard to actual key differences. Loading times are reduced, the UI is better, bugs have been fixed. So I guess I can't really complain there. So yeah, since I've always been a bit more story focused above all else, I'll piss off one or two of you out there so that I can look at shinier graphics. Before I begin, I've got some fat news. Look at this plushie. That's right, this little guy is now available for... Uh, like two weeks or something. Then it's never being made again, ever. If 10 of these things get made, then there's only 10 in the world, ever. Here's a list of things that they can do. One, look like that. Two, hold your spilled drinks. Three, sit on the shelf. Anyways, you can get one of these if you visit some kind of link in my description. I might even pin it, who knows. And finally, I've got a sponsor for Displate in this video that will magically appear at random in a jarringly aggressive cut after some planet or another. Please pay attention to it if you want tasteful planks of metal at a discounted rate. All right, let's play the space game now. So Mass Effect 1 left us with everything wrapped up relatively neatly. The Reaper invasion had been repelled, the Citadel's races were saved, and John Mass Effect went on to be the badass that he was destined to continue being. Oh yeah, spoilers for Mass Effect 1. I always forget to do that. And Mass Effect 2. And partially Mass Effect 3. Anyways, things are looking pretty good for the universe at large. Shit. So to reel things back a bit, John Shepard has been sent by the Citadel to track down Geth stragglers following the Reaper attack which rocked the station. This is regarded as a very stupid move by an interested party which might be vaguely familiar depending on how much attention you paid to Mass Effect 1's smaller details. I'll recap exactly who and what the Cerberus group is in a bit. For now, this Geth tracking was largely fruitless as the cinematic which plays out has the Normandy's crew squabbling about whether or not there's even Geth out in this region of space. I find it funny how Shepard's crew was generally called upon by humanity and the Citadel to get all of the work done in the first game, no matter how small the task. And then they prove themselves to be heroes who deserve the utmost respect, and are immediately rewarded by being sent to track down some potential Geth out in the sticks of space. I mean, yeah, sure, pursuing Geth is important, but it just seems like you're sending your queen to get ganked by a bishop. Which is exactly what happens when an unknown vessel detects the Normandy through its top-of-the-line stealth fields and begins slicing it up like a loaf of ham. So Shep sends Liara to escort the rest of his crew to the escape pods, while he goes to rescue Joker from the front of the ship. I'll haul Joker's crippled ass out of here. This is easily one of the best introductions to a video game that I've ever played, just from a pure, unrivaled intrigue perspective. The ship which you got to know so well in the first game is in a million pieces. The roof has been shredded and exposed to the vacuum of space. A gigantic planet looms above you as electronics fizzle and pop around you. It's a lot like KOTOR 2's introduction in many ways, though with less of a tutorial in sheer mystery and more of an in-your-face and visceral experience. As Shepard gets Joker into an escape pod, he's blown back by an explosion. He launches Joker away from the husk of the Normandy and succumbs to his fate, tumbling into space before suffocating from the leaks in his suit. For the average person, I imagine that this whole scene has to be somewhat of a shock. 
I mean, when I see a movie in which the main character is clearly in danger, especially right at the start of it, I've always got this pin in the back of my mind telling me that there's no way that they die. I mean, why would they? And in this case, who would replace Shepard as our main character? Well, the answer is nobody. You see, Shepard has no reason to work with Cerberus as things stand. He's been successful at doing what he's done, accomplishing feats of heroism across the universe while actually trading blows with Cerberus every here and there, which is why this introduction sequence was planned out the way that it was. What follows is a sequence in which the player is flooded with sci-fi imagery depicting the Lazarus Project, which is what Shepard undergoes as he's forced back to life by Cerberus. His fractured bones are stitched back together. His withered heart is jostled back to life. It's a really goddamn cool sequence and it adeptly showcases one of the best ways in which Shepard would ever tie himself to Cerberus, because he owes them. Now, there was something that was bothering me about the Legendary Edition, which was that I couldn't transfer my Mass Effect 1 saves to it. This meant that I couldn't continue using my version of Shepard who made the choices which he made. Fortunately, there is a pretty decent remedy here in the form of this interactive comic which the game included as an option to help you choose what you chose in the first game, without actually importing your character. Not every choice is here, but this is still a pretty neat way which the devs included to build your Shep back up the way that you want him to be, and even allows you to change some choices that you made in the first game if you so choose. For me though, I just repicked everything that I chose the first time around. Liara over Ashley, Rachni Queen saved, Rex saved, Caden saved, Council saved, Anderson for Human Ambassador. The entire process takes about 14 minutes or so, which surprised me. You're telling me that you can recap a game in 14 minutes? I think I've been doing things wrong. The biggest issue with losing my old save file is the fact that I've got to rebuild Shep again, which to be fair is pretty fun. I can't sculpt the guy, which is actually fine by me. I almost prefer presets in a way, as sculpting can be a pain in the ass and reminds me of my 3D animation degree which I never used for anything. Eventually I wind up recreating my boy, albeit a little different. But that's to be expected, dude was ricocheting through space like he was a Rocket League car. So now it's time to choose our class. I'm not going to run through all of the options here again as the choices are the same as the previous game, and I explained things pretty decently in that video. I swear that's gotta be one of my favorite parts about doing a sequel video, not having to elaborate on the smaller details which I already covered. Now there are some minor to moderate changes from game to game in terms of what abilities and the like that each class receives. I won't go too in depth on those, but I will say that each class in this game does have a unique ability which further separates them from the others. These abilities can be upgraded later much in the same way that you would choose a specialization class midway through Mass Effect 1. Now, I chose the Adept class in my Mass Effect 1 playthrough, and I got slapped around for the majority of the game. It made me think a little harder before engaging, and I generally appreciated it. I don't particularly want to be a soldier, as I've definitely been one when I played previously. It's a good well-rounded choice, and I imagine it's about as close to the default experience that you can get in this game. The Infiltrator and Engineer classes don't do too much for me personally as I've always felt like that I would appreciate them more if the game was in first person for some reason. I don't know, it's just a personal preference. And the Sentinel is actually tempting, as it's probably the tankiest that you can be by choosing it. But Vanguard's been calling to me for a while now. It's been reworked quite a lot since the first game, having it opt for a much more up-close and personal kind of combat experience. But the main thing that's been added to it is the class-specific ability of charging enemies like a fucking linebacker and sending them flying across the battlefield. I'm not sure how good the pathing is going to be to make this thing work, but I've always had a weak spot for melee fighters, even if you're not really wielding any melee weapon in this game. Anyways, Shepard eventually wakes up a little too early at the medical facility that he's been getting rebuilt in before they put him back under. Heart rate's still climbing. Brain activity is off the charts. When our guy wakes up again, the medical facility is under attack, and Shepard's gotta immediately start fighting his way out to survive it. This brings us to our tutorial, which comes with your standard grab gun and armor, equip gun and armor, and shoot enemies with gun while wearing armor. Now the problem here is that this game has one of the most baffling decisions that I've ever witnessed folded into its control schemes. Okay, so here's the deal. The space bar allows you to interact and pick things up, it also allows you to get into cover. It also allows you to sprint. 
This isn't the lawless land of the late 90s, or 2006 if you're Bethesda, in which nobody knew what the best control scheme was for games on PC. This is a goddamn remaster of a game that came out in 2010. I could see the spacebar being used for cover, but for interacting and sprinting? What the fuck? Fortunately, a second keybind is possible here, so I can do both E and Shift, but wow. Anyways, everything else is pretty standard, I guess. You can shoot your gun, use a pause menu to choose your next move or order a party member around, and slink into cover when need be. I feel like I've been saying this more recently in my life, but the camera feels way too close to the back of my guy in most third-person action games. I think I'm just used to like 120 FOV in games now. But regardless, we get walked through how the game is played. I think my favorite part is the idea that this public access computer in the middle of this hallway has a data log where one of the scientists calls Miranda a cold-hearted bitch. I don't know, maybe he wanted her to know. So eventually we meet one of our new crew members, Jacob. Jacob's a biotic soldier type who served under the Alliance for a while before joining up with Cerberus as their head of security under Miranda. I'm gonna dive much deeper into pretty much every crew member at once when we grab all of them and leave their descriptions at the basics for now. For now, what you need to know is that the director of the project in charge of bringing you back to life was supposedly the one that betrayed everyone here by hacking the security and having the mechs attack everyone on the station. We find this out when Miranda shows up and puts a bullet in his neck. Miranda is about as cold and calculating as they come, and she immediately explains that Cerberus is holding all of the cards, and that you have no choice but to believe her side of the story and to come with her. This is in pretty direct contrast to Jacob being a more emotionally intelligent person, one who understands that Shepard is gonna be pretty on edge about trusting them immediately. We'll again talk about them more later, as we then evac from the station to go meet with Cerberus's shadowy background leader, the Elusive Man. Meeting with the Elusive Man is probably one of the more vivid and peculiar moments that I've ever had while playing a game. BioWare definitely nailed the visual and audio cues here to perfectly convey the sense of importance that this man has. And of course, Martin Sheen voicing him had a huge part in driving the character home. As expected of the mastermind behind Cerberus, the elusive man has Shepard meeting him through a hologram type of device as a precaution just in case Shep would normally attempt to cave his skull in or something. The quick recap of who and what exactly Cerberus is based off of our interactions with them in the first game is that they're a group of humans who splintered off from the Alliance and began experimenting with the creation of super soldiers. They seem to have a complex about humanity's role in the universe, and pretty much openly oppose the Alliance's philosophies as not putting enough importance on humans. As such, the elusive man's primary goal in bringing Shepard back to life is to help humanity. It's an interesting role to give the player, not unlike a Jedi in a Star Wars game or a superhero in a Marvel game. But I guess the difference here is that Shepard feels both like a legendary hero and a common soldier who happened to make it through the perils that he faced. It's definitely a unique position to be placed in, as Shep further reinforces by scratching his head at the idea that Cerberus spent billions of credits to bring him back to life instead of drumming up an army. But as the elusive man puts it, human colonies have been disappearing in droves and the Alliance is still recovering from the Reaper attack on the Citadel. So you're the person for this job, and you're to now go investigate the latest colony which the human presence has disappeared from, and then report back to the Elusive Man with what you find. Now I will say that for as cool as this entire introduction sequence is, I almost wish the devs had taken the time to flesh out a small alternate path where Shepard outright refuses to work with Cerberus. I mean, as things stand, you get the elusive man and Jacob stating that they don't expect Shepard to trust them immediately. But this kind of direct writing is more for placating the player rather than the character. It's one of those things where the player is naturally going to be distrustful of Cerberus' intentions after everything that's happened has happened. I mean, we still don't know why the lead scientist on the Lazarus Project suddenly betrayed the station. It's not even brought up as an option here, which is annoying. And yet, Shepard immediately chomps at the bit like the side quest machine that he is when the elusive man tasks him with yet another settlement needing his help. I mean, sure, there's some initial I don't trust you dialogue options, but all roads lead back to the elusive man going, I know, I know, you don't trust me, I get it. Anyways, human colony, get on it. So at this stage, we can't go, hey, no, I don't trust you, Cerberus only to have them present some kind of ultimatum, or some sort of very strong motivation for Shepard to obey, 
or hell, even letting him walk away only to cross paths with him later in his time of need. I know this all seems like a small point to harp on, but it really sets the tone for how this game functions. It's a tough situation because on one hand, does every game need a strong variety of choices with different story outcomes? Does the prospect of a morality bar or a dialogue wheel cause people to just expect a staggering amount of choice in any given dialogue? Or should people just trust the writers here to make the correct decisions to make their storytelling the strongest that it can be? I'd say that the answer likely lies in the middle, and there are choices in this game, don't get me wrong. It's just that oftentimes the setups have much less choice variety than the conclusions. And that does get a bit distracting when you try to find something out like why Dr. Wilson decided to betray Cerberus after taking lead on Project Lazarus and reviving you. And it turns out that the only real reason that the writers gave him for this was the fact that he was working for the Shadow Broker. There's nothing more than that, which tells you that the devs just wanted to build a tutorial level with a bit more intrigue, but didn't actually care to expand on the reason for the tutorial level happening the way that it did. Either way, I'll stave off my ranting for now and shift over to the leveling system which is showcased right after this. So the big thing here is that this game has a way more simplified leveling system at first glance, which is kind of funny because Mass Effect 1's leveling system is pretty damn basic. But in this game, I have a six whole skills to start with, which take 10 points each to max out. You have to sink one point and then two and then three and then four into each skill to advance at one stage each time. Three of these skills are only unlocked after getting their prerequisite skill to level two. And then you can get a fat load of skills which you can unlock later on through research and loyalty missions. This is a game changer as you can now have up to 12 more powers, 14 if you count the DLC and optional powers. Though it is worth noting that you can only have seven skills total which kind of makes sense, but at least you can switch them out. The best part though is that your skills evolve into one of two options when you get them to level four, which definitely adds a bit more variety to each skill's final form. I found this kind of neat in its own way just due to how every class has a much more solid identity than it did before. A lot of that is due to the weapon mastery and support skills missing, which were skills that overlapped a lot more heavily between classes in the first game. Either way, as far as Vanguard is concerned, I have two ammo skills which affect the type of damage that I dish out, I have the aforementioned charge skill, which just bodies people. I have a pull, which is like a force push, but the other way around. I have a shock wave attack, which shockingly sends out a wave from me in some kind of wavy, shocky force. And I have a passive skill, which grants me more health and damage, less power recharge time, and additional paragon slash renegade percentage. I didn't actually know what that last bit meant from reading it, and I couldn't figure it out from Googling it but retraining my skills later had me figuring out that it gave a boost to my current Paragon and Renegade scores. So maybe it affects every morality decision that you've made in addition to future ones. Throughout your journey, you'll get side quests, and each one seems to net around 40 XP. I'm talking like the little side quests, like this person wants wine, or this person wants power couplings, or this person wants food. But I never noticed that 40 XP mattering. Instead, every time that I complete a main mission or a bigger side mission, I gain a level. I think there was one or two times where I didn't gain a level after completing a major mission. It's weird because it almost feels like the 40 XP for side quests is there to just make the player feel a sense of pride and accomplishment rather than actually doing anything. I mean, I'm sure it does matter to some degree, it just, like, you get 750 XP or some shit like that from doing normal missions, on average. So it's onward to the former human colony of Freedom's Progress in order to figure out what happened with it. This has us hitting a strange sort of screen where the game summarizes the credits, experience, and so on that we gained during the first part of the game. It's kind of jarring because it makes me feel like this game is a super linear experience, even though it isn't. But either way, we land planet side and run immediately into Tally after taking on the reprogrammed bots and discovering that the humans here completely disappeared without a trace. It's kind of a weird interaction because you have these other Aquarians who are with her who recognize us as Cerberus. They freak out and claim not to trust us, which is a fine reaction all things considered. Tally on the other hand is like, oh, is that you? Huh, strange. Anyways, yeah, we're here for Aquarian who was on a pilgrimage. Oh, uh, yeah, all right. I mean, sure, she's definitely grown and is more of a leader type now, so I kind of get the whole we'll talk later kind of vibe. I was just kind of hoping for more of a reaction than that. I mean, Shepard was dead to her. Oh well. 
so we continue fighting our way to the Quarian who Tally was here for. And I gotta say, this game is fucking weird. Like, exploration and combat-wise, it's just really odd. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's not a lot different from Mass Effect 1, but it just seems like it should naturally be a lot more polished and balanced. Like, first of all, I get dropped in with two weapons. I can't look specifically at what these weapons are in the menus, or equip anything else. The shotgun seems to decimate anything that I pointed at. Nothing seems to have a tremendous amount of recoil besides my machine pistol. Cover just explodes and is gone in like a second. You don't find random weapons and armor to replace your old stuff with. You just seem to find credits, salvage, and minerals. And I'll explain a lot of this later, but it just feels like the devs went, oh, Mass Effect 1? Yeah, it's way too complicated. Looting new weapons and armor while exploring? Light, medium, and heavy armor? Nah, let's streamline that. The biggest issue that I have is that the armor sets that you get tend to have these large chunks of stats, yeah, sure. But there are also a few sets with individual pieces. And these pieces tend to add up to bigger stat boosts, which you can customize to suit your playstyle and class, which is the much better way to go in my eyes. The problem here is that there's only like three or so sets which have these pieces, and some random parts which don't seem to have a set to them. I wish I could just mix and match from the full sets, but I can't. Which means that oftentimes getting a new set of armor means that I've just collected it for my own viewing pleasure. I'm just not a big fan of the changes here. I do have to say that I enjoy the hacking minigames though, which has nothing to do with armor and is more of an afterthought which I had no idea what to do with. At any rate, we soon run into our escaped Quarian, who's frantically trying to cause a robot uprising. I get to perform my first Paragon action in the game, which is turning off his monitors for some reason. I think anybody who's played these games knows about this one, but Paragon and Renegade actions during cutscenes allow you to either suck someone's dick or rip it clean off at the press of a button. And that's probably the very best way I can describe it to someone who isn't aware of the system. It's also worth noting that the Charm and Intimidate skills are completely removed in favor of the new morality system. Well, I say new, but it really isn't much different from the old system. It's just, again, more streamlined, as having your Paragon maxed out doesn't also require you to sink points into Charm, and instead allows you to perform Paragon actions if it's high enough. Also, Bioware seems to have taken a page from Fable, and that if you go full Renegade, your scars will crackle and glow brighter along with your eyes and they'll heal up if you go full Paragon. I mean, if it is a tribute to the series, it's not a bad one, but it also does feel a tad out of place in my eyes. I guess I expect Fable to be more fantasy-based and silly, but I also expect Mass Effect to feel a bit more serious, and running around with glowing-ass red eyes looking like Darth Scion at home feels a bit out of place. Well, our guy begins frantically pointing at the screens, showing us footage of what Miranda recognizes as collectors. Collectors are the boogeymen of the universe from how her and Jacob tell it. Basically, they collect shit. I know, I probably should have warned you before dropping that knowledge bomb on you, but we just don't have time. The key takeaway here is that the collectors are known only by few, and have been seen so rarely that a lot of people don't even believe they exist. In this case, it appears that they've started to collect humans, which explains why colonies have been up and vanishing. The footage shows them utilizing some tiny drone-like insects to inject and freeze subjects before collecting them like Yu-Gi-Oh cards. We get the option to take this guy with us to interrogate him or to just grab his data. Obviously, one of these curries favor with Tally, while the other one leans more towards Miranda's cold ass. We go with Tally and then part ways before submitting the data to the elusive man. The footage of the collectors doesn't seem to surprise him as much as the amount of humans that they seem to be after. His explanation is that the collectors are usually after rarer specimens with more unique genetic defects and the like, and that they usually don't care about random normal people. Using this newfound behavior and some other collected data, the elusive man comes to the conclusion that the collectors must be working for the Reapers. It's a sound decision to jump to, all things considered, but this is what motivates Cerberus right now. Many have feared their actions in the past, and they've definitely done some shady shit. But the primary goal as of right now is taking action against the Reapers and making sure that they can't worm their way out of dark space to begin wreaking havoc on all life. At least that's how Cerberus is presenting themselves right now. And I kind of get where they're coming from, all things considered. The Alliance is rebuilding, which means that they're kind of just catching their breath and burying their heads in the sand. 
because they won against Sovereign and foiled the plot to open up dark space and let the rest of the Reapers through. So why bother chasing down Geth and the like? Well, Cerberus isn't super excited about ignoring a potential galaxy-ending threat and is taking the law into their own hands. I guess I can kind of understand why Shepard is willing to put aside past differences to work with Cerberus here, but he still feels like an elaborate plank of wood that just kind of does whatever someone orders him to do at this stage. But this is where the game really starts to open up at last, as the elusive man insists that you should build up a reliable team to take on the collectors with. Of course, you can ask about your old team, which I do in order of favorites. Rex is off trying to unite his people, meaning that he won't have time to join us this time around. Garrus disappeared soon after the Normandy exploded. Liara is potentially working for the Shadow Broker on Ilium. Tally is, well, we know what's going on with her. And Caden is still kicking around the Alliance. So until you do or don't meet your old team, it's off to find some new members. You're greeted by a familiar face in the form of Joker, who explains that the Alliance completely shut down Shepard's operations after he died. So Joker hauled ass out of there to join Cerberus instead of dealing with the barrage of bureaucracy that comes with being a member of the Alliance. The Normandy has been reconstructed by Cerberus's seemingly endless funding, and we're finally ready to kick ass again. It's a pretty damn fun moment in the game, and it feels good to make it back from death. Now, the new Normandy definitely has some extra bells and whistles to it, but I actually want to talk about all of that later, as much of the ship is sealed off until we make it to certain events of this game. I actually like this system, as it feels like you're progressing piece by piece and gaining new stuff to play with as you do. So after checking out the areas that I could check out, remembering where future crew members hang out at, and aggressively hitting on my subordinates where I can, I fire up the new and improved Galaxy Map. Sounds like a Samsung product. Introducing the Galaxy Map Plus. We have an absolute load of things to do, and in any order that we want to, more or less. It's actually crazy the amount of freedom that we get here, and choosing to bring certain crew with you on specific missions gives you new dialogue and interesting events to witness. It's probably one of my favorite things about this game, as you can really shake things up from playthrough to playthrough. That said, I want the full experience for this video so I've done a little digging to figure out how to squeeze the most out of my playthrough. So while the game suggests that you can recruit the professor first so that you can use his skills for a bevy of benefits, I'm going to instead head for who our dossier refers to as the veteran. This has us dropping by Omega, which is a haven for terrorists, criminals, and mercenaries. I love this concept as there's no central government, just crime bosses who compete back and forth for turf. One of these bosses wants to see me immediately, as their lackey notes that things tend to explode around me frequently. But I'm not worried about that yet. Let's go pick up our first recruit, who's one of the most infamous bounty hunters in the galaxy. So the thing about telling the player that they're going to be recruiting a veteran badass who only cares about credits is that you have to deliver someone who isn't cheesy, but is still cool. There's a fine line with these mercenary types, especially when you're coming in as a hero who is looking to potentially recruit the Merc for a large majority of the game. The example that always springs to mind since I played it is Kalo Nord in KOTOR 1. He starts off as this badass who refuses to talk to you and only counts down from three before blasting you into oblivion. But later on, when you've gained some levels, you just trounce him with absolutely zero issue and it makes him look like this goofy idiot when you play again later because you know how weak he really is after you get some levels under you. So with that in mind, how does our Merc recruit Zaid come off? Eh, he's pretty middle of the road. Extremely confident, but not arrogant to a point where he's trying to boss you around immediately. He seems to have respect for Shepard and the elusive man, but generally reviews signing on to this mission as another job with a good payout. If anything, I'd say that he reminds me of Candorus, which is a good thing. Anyways, he finishes up with hauling his bounty away before letting you know that he'll meet you on the ship. So since we're still at the very start of Omega, we're actually going to spin back around and head for the Master Thief on the dossier. Basically, I want these two in my party for the recruitment of the Professor, as they have some dialogue specific to him. It's worth noting here that you can kick around the system that you're in with no issue, but to move to another system in the Nebula, you have to buy fuel. It's an interesting mechanic, but like, you're never gonna have an issue with a lack of fuel. Even when you do run out, you just lose some currency and get teleported back to a system where you can buy fuel. 
I mean, for all intents and purposes, refueling just feels kind of more like a, oh yeah, I gotta refuel before I leave. I don't hate it, but it doesn't really add anything to the game in my eyes. Either way, we grab the Master Thief Kasumi immediately, as she's also right at the entrance of the Citadel where you arrive. So it's back to Omega again, where we can finally tap into this place as we go to meet with the Professor. Man, I gotta say, seeing Omega plotted out with all of the details that it has really makes me look at older Bioware stuff and appreciate how far the developer had come with ideas like these. Just thinking about the lower and under city of Terrace and KOTOR, and then the Citadel and Mass Effect 1, kinda makes me really feel like things had gotten to that stage where you could look at a Bioware setting and understand the exact feelings and ideas that they wanted to impart onto the player. It's a visual feast for the eyes, but not in an aesthetically beautiful way. It's the grimy and run-down beggars and addicts, the messy, dust-collecting piles of old tech and scrap, all mixed with bright, pulsing lights, the exuberant partygoers, and the elegant but dangerous organized crime elements that make Omega the setting that it is. It's definitely one of the more immersive areas in the game for me personally, and I've always enjoyed this kind of aesthetic in my space media. So I wander around for a bit, talking to random people, helping a quarian pay his way off the station, getting a bartender killed who tried to poison me, and shopping for bits and pieces around the slummy market area. I will say that the morality system here does make itself more apparent in how it functions as the side quest where I get poisoned by the bartender only allows for me to utilize the Paragon option to get him killed. I get the logistics of it, but I'm just not a huge fan of how this system works emotionally. So basically, I couldn't perform the Renegade action here because I don't have enough Renegade points. I was actually going to perform that option here because I've seen it before and I like it a lot as it makes the bartender drink his own poison. But as things stand, I was forced to choose the neutral option or the paragon option because I was nice to everyone so far. It's one of those things where I wish I could be the upstanding and nice shepherd, but if somebody personally wrongs me or someone close to me, I'd love to break the renegade option out on their ass. Like I said, logically, it kind of makes sense for Shepard to not be so chaotic with how he treats people, but at the same time, I feel like renegade options are great for when you're pissed at someone. Where's my anger management issues roleplay, Bioware? All right, so down to business. I wind up heading to the person who has assigned themselves as the official, unofficial ruler of all of Omega. I am Omega. She seems pretty down to earth, but more importantly, she gives us information on both the Professor and the other recruit known as Archangel. Like I said, we'll be grabbing the Professor first, who seems to be helping sick people around another goddamn quarantine area in a video game. I'm not even gonna comment on it this time. Today's plague flavor seems to be one that doesn't affect humans specifically, which is a lucky break for us since every one of my crew happened to be human. The big thing is that there's another species of aliens called the Vorcha here, who are naturally immune to disease and are now moving in on a particular gang's turf. So there's pretty much non-stop fighting in addition to the plague killing off most of the alien population here. Airborne transmission across numerous species, near perfect mortality rate, had to be created in a lab. Now throughout this journey, you'll encounter several people who aren't hostile, of whom you can ask about Morden Solis, the professor who we're here to recruit. And from the sounds of things, this guy sounds like a terrifying monster of a doctor. One is just as likely to heal your ass as he is to kick your ass. The doctor? Yeah, crazy bastard opened a clinic in the district a few months ago. I was afraid to go to him before. He is dangerous, but perhaps he can help. That guy is crazy. He'll patch up a gunshot wound for free, then kick your ass and throw you out when you try to grab a few painkillers. Be honest, man. You kind of had that coming. No way he's just a doctor. No doctor puts down a Blue Sun squad like that. He's not just a doctor. Doctors don't execute people and display the bodies as a warning. It's probably the best description for someone who winds up looking and sounding like this. Here, take Plague Cure. Also, bonus in good faith, weapon from Dead Blue Sun's marks may come in handy against Fortune. One more thing, Daniel, one of my assistants, went into Vorcha territory looking for victims. Wasn't always a doctor. Some work with Solarian Special Tasks Group. can handle myself. Advantage of being Solarian. Turians, Krogan, Vorcha, all obvious threats. Never see me coming. I love Morden. He's definitely one of my favorite characters from back when I played before. Though I think a lot of this might have been due to his character evolution in Mass Effect 3. He does take a bit of time to fully understand since he talks so quickly, but he's really fun to listen to when you ask him about various topics. 
He quickly explains that he believes that the Vorcha are being used by the Collectors to spread the plague that the Collectors created, which aligns our interests nicely. But first he wants to deploy a cure for the plague which he whipped up by using the ventilation system which the Vorcha are now guarding. As we're about to head out, the Vorcha figure out how to disable the oxygen system entirely for the district, and everyone is now at risk of suffocating. Yeehaw. I think now's probably a decent time to give my feedback a little more on the combat. So it definitely feels more fluid than the first game. The Vanguard in particular seems to embody that high risk, high reward style of combat that I enjoy, as my charge attack has me putting myself into the thick of things. With a shotgun, this usually has me cleaning up as long as there aren't too many threats around. I was actually surprised by the sheer distance that I could cover and the obstacles I could phase through, and it made the game way different than when I was running Biotics in Mass Effect 1, or as a soldier in my previous runs. Sure, there's definitely still going to be times where cover is important, and shooting back and forth is kind of a necessity, but the charge is usually what starts or ends a fight for me, and I like that a lot. Controlling squad members is pretty straightforward, and I found that they generally took care of themselves without needing too much babysitting from me, which is a massive improvement from the first game in my eyes. I mean, there were too many times to count in Mass Effect 1 where my squad would just kind of get stuck on geometry or wouldn't move up despite me telling them to, so the improvements in 2 are definitely welcome. And finally, the ammo system is a little weird. Ammo is so abundant in this game that I don't really know why it exists besides for heavy stuff like the grenade launcher. Because every gun uses the exact same type of ammo besides the heavy weapons. And every enemy that uses guns drops said ammo. And every little sliver of ammo that you pick up almost completely restores your ammo. Or it completely does, I don't really know. All I know is I got a shitload after picking it up. So you might run out of ammo in one gun if you stick behind cover the whole time but then you can kind of just move up and grab more. It doesn't really feel like it has a purpose to me other than the fact that guns should have ammo. In fact, I would say the whole gun system is kind of based around reloading as a method of balancing. In the first game, you had a system where your weapons had infinite ammunition, but if you fired them too frequently, they would overheat. It wasn't my favorite system, but it kind of worked to balance the game in its own way. I feel like the devs wanted to remove the large abundance of mods, ammo types, and weapon slash armor types to, again, streamline the game a bit. And their solution to that was giving the guns ammo, but making the balance more about reloading rather than ammo management. It's not a terrible system in all honesty, but it does feel like it belongs more in an action-y shooter game rather than an RPG, which is a scary foreshadowing for the direction that a lot of RPGs have tended to go since 2010. It's not so much that a game has to have a thousand moving parts in order to be a great RPG, as much that it should probably have a fair amount of player agency beyond just choosing your class. And I think that's the main thing that threw me off about seeing a skill system stripped down to six skills that have 10 points each max. If someone else chooses a Vanguard, they're going to have the exact same abilities by the end of the game as I do, besides the loyalty ability they would have the exact same weapon loadout save for a handful of changes. Compare that to the previous game. I choose a Vanguard who focuses on shotgun damage and barrier first and foremost. I primarily fight by using my powers defensively to give myself more survivability. Somebody else could also take this single class in Mass Effect 1 and build it to basically be a tankier adept, with focus on lift, warp, and throw powers first and foremost. They could focus on pistols instead of shotguns. And that kind of creativity is almost completely shunted off the tracks when you dumb down the system to a point where it actively leaves no room for experimentation beyond changing your base class to something else, especially when allies have even less options. But don't get me wrong, I'm not sitting here saying that Mass Effect 2 is an awful game because of it. I think it did exactly what the devs set out for it to do, and it didn't get in the way of my enjoyment of the combat or the story. But it's also a slippery slope in the way of the RPG in my eyes because I think it was the little things like these which caused the bigger devs to realize that players don't need complex and enriching skill or leveling systems to buy a game. And I think that this has caused the average RPG from bigger studios to be less focused on skill trees and points and builds, and more focused on action and cinematic moments. The fucked up part in my eyes is that these aren't even mutually exclusive on paper. Sure, you can spend more time on some of these things over others, but you can also craft an engaging system where no two builds are alike pretty easily also. Anyways, that's been my TED talk about bullshit that probably doesn't matter. Let's play more Mass Effect.
All right, so down to business. So we continue pressing our way to the ventilation system, and suddenly these Vorcha guys just spell out the entire plot that we just found out. It's really on the nose. Like, Morden spews out this theory that he has about the Vorcha working for the Collectors. And then immediately after, one of them is like, ha ha, we work for the Collectors. We're gonna shut down the vents. You have the cure and we're gonna stop the vents. The Collectors will make us strong and that's why they recruited us. What the fuck? So much for trying to figure this mystery out through investigation. So yeah, we power through them, turn the vents back on, inject the cure and grab Morden. Kind of a mediocre mission overall, but at least we have the science lab up and running now. I just like how Morden makes it to the ship and we start getting into the details about other colonies disappearing, and the Paragon option comes in like it's the most dramatic moment in the universe. Gas, maybe? No. Spreads too slow. Airborne virus? No. Slow you don't have guess. to sit there and guess. Nothing makes me feel more like a weenie than choosing a Paragon option only for it to be telling Morden to shut up. But hey, I did it valorously and with great wisdom and kindness. Please, shut the fuck up. Anyways, now that the science labs are open, let's chat exactly about how the weapons and armor work. So like I said, you're not scavenging new weapons from enemies out on the battlefield. Instead, you can occasionally get a weapon or armor set from a vendor as a part of a quest, or you can research it. Oh, and also from DLC. There's a fair amount of DLC in this game that just kind of gives you loads of weapons and armor, much like Dragon Age Origins did. Fortunately, the legendary edition of the game comes with all of it, because this game seriously lacks in weapons and armor without the DLC. Unfortunately though, you can only really customize those armor sets that I mentioned before. You can choose the color, the material type, how shiny it is, whether or not you wear a helmet. Actually, the helmet gives you plus 5% health if you choose to wear it. It's really cool to customize and it's super annoying when you can't apply the same kind of customization to full sets. Because there are some armors that I enjoy looking at. But I don't always want Shepard to be wearing this chitinous bug helmet when conversing with people. I even took it off in favor for my normal gear for probably most of the game. The weapons on the other hand, I don't really know which are better. It's really weird, but when I go to the weapon bench in this game, there's no stats for various weapons that you can equip. For a while, I was just convinced that choosing your gun was a matter of picking out which one looked the coolest to you. But upon Googling for a list of weapons, there is a difference between them. Some have more base damage, some do more damage against certain armor types, some have more ammo, and it's one of the most bizarre decisions I've ever seen in a game. Because it's not like they just forgot, right? Because there are stats on the fucking armor. At least, some of it. I don't know, something went wrong here and it wasn't fixed in the Legendary Edition either. Either way, the Tech Lab allows for you to take your collected Iridium, Palladium, Platinum, and Element Zero and squish them into research projects which then net you new weapons, armors, and upgrades for your gear and ship. Plus, talking to each new crew member usually has them giving you a unique upgrade exclusive to them. With the right supplies, I can fortify our shields. Cock and ball torture. It's actually one of my favorite systems in this game, and it makes scanning planets way more enjoyable than in the first game because you're constantly pushing towards a new upgrade. Speaking of, yes, planet scanning is back, and it's more of an oil baron simulator than ever. So before, you would scan planets and get lore and complete side objectives, and sometimes you would land on them and flip your Hot Wheels car around the planet for a bit. In this one, they removed the Mako and instead put in a mini-game where you can manually scan each planet bit by bit for resources before launching probes at it in an effort to make the United States proud and drain it of its natural resources. It's fucking great. And it sucks. Like, again, it's one of those dopamine hit kind of ordeals where you're stoked to suck a planet dry like you're in college. But after snatching up load after planet-sized load, you kind of start to grow a bit weary of it all, despite getting rewarded with trinkets and baubles every time. I think I overall enjoyed it, but I would have liked to have seen upgraded probes, which allow you to fire multiple at once or hit larger areas in general to speed up the process after a while. Also worth noting that you can still get side missions through scanning planets, usually in the form of a distress beacon or the like. These missions generally take anywhere from three to 10 minutes, depending on how much you loot or look around. One of the earliest ones that I found had me taking out some people who captured a Cerberus operative. 
The operative wound up dying, but the data that they got out of him reflected poorly on Cerberus. You then get to choose whether or not to send it back to Cerberus, leak it to the Alliance, or keep it for yourself. All right, let's bag our next crew member. This one goes by the Warlord, which sounds like a winner to me. According to our dossier, the Krogan is a doctor in addition to being a warlord, and only seems to care about curing the genophage. It's definitely a strong case for a super unique character. Well, getting to the guy has us marching through Blue Sun's territory, which is actually the same gang that we had to fight off back on Omega. The leader of this particular set of Blue Sun seems to have struck some kind of deal here with the Krogan Warlord, but we don't find out what exactly is happening until we make it to the end, as Bioware really piles on the intrigue throughout this endeavor. Midway through our rampage through the suns, we encounter a Krogan who seems complacent, but also very driven. It's a strange mesh of personalities, like he's almost confused as he claims that he was created seven days ago in a tank that he refers to as the Glass Mother. What's happening here is that the Warlord has been talking to and teaching these synthetic lab-made Krogans while they grew and learned in their pods. Basically, the Blue Sun's leader was promised a Krogan army, and so she let the Warlord start experimenting away. When a Krogan was deemed not good enough, whether because of some mental instability or other defect, it was then used as live combat training target practice for the Suns. Basically, this place is a war zone of their own creation to help them root out the best of the best in terms of mercenary expertise. It's a weird way of doing things, but I kind of respect it. When we get to the end, we meet this warlord, whose name is Okir. Okir has been working his ass off, even striking a deal with the collectors to basically create the perfect Krogan. So instead of curing the genophage as previously was thought, he wants to build a Krogan who simply ignores the genophage and thrives despite it. Of course, all of this experimentation has also led to a lot of crazy-ass Krogans being shot out into the Blue Sun's training lounge, and it's gotten so bad that the Blue Sun's leader has decided that this batch of Krogan soldiers for her army was no good, and that they should be flushed. Which is unfortunate for Okir, seeing as he had been putting the finishing touches on the apex of his research. A single Krogan soldier who was deemed to be perfect, but still in his tank. As the Sun's leader orders the tanks to be flushed, Okir panics and pleads with us to take out the leader in exchange for the knowledge of what the Collectors shared with him to make the project a reality. So we head on down to fight the Sun's leader, kick her ass, and then the ship's AI says something about gas flooding a room. This part never made any sense to me and it still doesn't. So when you make it back up to the room with Okir, it turns out that he died due to the gas flooding his room. I don't understand how this happened, the official explanation is that the Blue Sun's leader realized that Okir was double-crossing her, and that she decided to flush everything along with him. But you have to understand that he could have just walked out of the room, like we did. We walked out of the room. And you could say, well, he didn't want to leave his perfect soldier in case something happened. But what are the odds that the Blue Sun's mercs would run into a room filled with gas to shoot a tank with a still Krogan? And even if they were trying to do that, why wouldn't you step just outside of the room and guard the entrance? Like, there's two ways into this area, and we went out one of them. If he went out the other, he's effectively preserving his life while guarding his perfect Krogan. It makes no sense because the writers didn't want anything to do with Okir anymore. They wanted him to leave or die somehow, but they still wanted the player to be able to meet and recruit the perfect Krogan into their crew and Okir more than likely wouldn't have let us do that otherwise, seeing as we were on a suicide mission. I followed the logic, but this is just shitty writing no matter how you slice it. I mean, let's come up with another idea or two that doesn't make zero fucking sense. What if Okir came to fight with you and died in battle? What if Okir spent his dying moments hammering away at the keys to redirect oxygen or to prevent his perfect Krogan's tank from being drained or whatever? What if Okir decided to come with you onto the Normandy along with the perfect Krogan with the intent to eventually leave and or double cross you when he deemed it necessary? I like this last one the best because it actually gives the player a reward for getting close to the perfect Krogan and that he'll turn on Okir in favor of sticking with Shep. Or it could punish the player by having the Krogans leave together suddenly in maybe some dramatic way. I don't know. It just seems really lame to have Okir get talked up as this crazy, awesome warlord who turned to being a doctor and contacted the collectors and began experimenting and all this other shit that we learn on the way up. Only for the game to go, oh yeah, he's dead now, poison gas, lol. 
Anyways, we grab the perfect Krogan with the Normandy and store the fucker in the cargo hold with the rest of the fruits and vegetables. Now we get to decide what to do with him. Either we keep him down here just to be safe, or... Human. Male. Before you die, I need a name. Warlord. Legacy. Grunt. Grunt. Grunt was among the last. It has no meaning. It'll do. I am Grunt. If you are worthy of your command, prove your strength and try to destroy me. Yeah, I fucking love Grunt. Maybe I just like Krogan's. But we'll talk more about his personality later down the line. For now, he's content to join us as long as we give him strong enemies to fight. He's extremely intelligent but lacks in wisdom since he's only seven days old and only knows what Okir imparted onto him. But most importantly, the game outright allows you to just keep him in the pod if you so choose, which is a cool option. So next up we have the Convict, who's being kept in space jail for being a space outlaw in space. Once again, the notorious Blue Suns make an appearance as the owners of this prison, which is starting to impress me with just how much real estate they have. Honestly though, I love the way this prison functions. This warden guy escorts you back to pick up the Convict, and he's like, yeah, so we got thousands of criminals here, and uh, they're dangerous as hell. Likewise, each prisoner's home planet pays a fee to us to keep them locked up here. Because if they don't, we just, uh, you know, release them back onto their home planet at an unspecified place and time. Jesus Christ, this is like the US prison system on crack. Anyways, back to the convict who Cerberus has paid the Blue Suns here to release into our custody. Of course, we're also in a big ass facility packed with armed guards and I'm sure the devs decided to just plot out a whole level layout just to have us pop in and out with no altercation. My apologies, Shepard. You're more valuable as a prisoner than a customer. Drop your weapons and proceed into this open cell. You will not be harmed. Wow, yeah, that's a great plan. Not an ambush of armed men in the cell. Not leaking gas into the room. Not storming the Normandy to take the crew hostage as a bargaining chip. Um, could you just please step in the cell? I I'd like you to be my prisoner. It'd be pretty cool. Please? Please? So yeah, I guess we're fighting our way to the convict. Oh yeah, her name's Jack, by the way. And she's fucking insane. Jack is small. Oh, I wanna see this. Let's go. Yeah, I'd probably be that pissed if I got put into cryostasis with that amount of nipple coverage too. Anyways, this is right about the time that any respect that you may have for the Blue Suns turns into bewilderment as they continue to consistently shit in their diapers every time you encounter them. Like this shit isn't, oh man, the Blue Suns sure are competent, but they're no match for the one and only Commander Shepard. It's more like, Wow, if these guys keep somehow finding success over and over, then I guess the galaxy really isn't anything to fear. Like, even towards the end of this sequence, the warden of this godforsaken space boat is sitting here like, so what if Jack literally just tore a hole through 50 layers of space age metals, effectively decimating half of our guard force and prison population which we've been using to profit off of, we can definitely still catch her and kill you. It just makes you feel like you're running up to a group of 10-year-old bullies and kicking their sandcastle over instead of taking on some fearsome gang of competent space mobsters. Anyways, we pick up Jack, who's pissed at the idea that we're with Cerberus. There's immediate distrust here, as she readies herself to rip Shepard's dick off, I assume. Shep talks her down, allowing her to access the files which Cerberus has on her in exchange for her cooperation. Miranda objects, but that doesn't matter. The promise gets Jack on board, which is good enough for me. If patterns have taught you anything here, it's that we'll talk more about her personality later. For now, I actually wanna talk about the idea of Jack as a party member. Now, don't get me wrong, every member we have here is a supremely dangerous killing machine in their own way. Not a single one of them should be taken lightly, as they all bring their own talents and expertise to the table. But we just watched as Jack more or less dismantled an entire space freighter that was big enough to hold 4,500 prisoners. 
Yeah, sure, we killed the warden and did our part, but she just blitzed through the reinforced metals made to hold prisoners like they were made out of cotton candy. The issue is that when you witness that kind of power immediately, it makes you expect your newfound party member to be able to do that same kind of crazy shit in battle when you take them. And while she is cool to use as a member of the squad, she operates on the same level as any other squad member here. I'm not saying that she should be pulling apart the geometry of a stage, but there was definitely a high bar set for what to expect when you see her. She has anime levels of power going for her, and that doesn't translate well to watching her perform the same kinds of maneuvers that any other squad member can more or less perform. I just think that they should have shown her capable of taking down mechs and guards with no problem, but left out the part where she destroys everything, or at least shown some kind of consequence of using that much power like her passing out, which would be a great way to get her quietly onto the Normandy. At any rate, we only have one more dossier at the moment, so let's go pick up an old friend of ours at last. Earlier on Omega, you get the description of a mercenary who set up shop here and just started unleashing justice onto the gangs. If that sounds like anyone from the previous game, you'd be correct in assuming that this is Garrus. Well, the Merc groups have gotten so agitated with our boy just destroying them that they've actually been inspired to unite against him to take him out. They've even begun recruiting volunteers to serve as cannon fodder while they try to flank Garrus. This is as good of a way of getting to him as any, so we sign up at the nightclub with the Blue Suns. After our reconnaissance, we take a transport over to where the three gangs who have united are planning their final attack on Garrus, who's pinned down and sniping every fucker who gets close. The thing is, we're gonna have to fight our way back after getting to him, which means that sabotaging the various mechs and machinery on the way over is probably a good idea, all things concerned. We also get to meet with some of the mercs, who are scratching their collective nutsacks while waiting for Garrus to be distracted enough to not notice the infiltration team moving in on him. This results in some pretty interesting dialogue with Grunt specifically, which I'll get into later. And Zaid also pipes in every here and there since he's in his element. Well, eventually I renegade a guy on the front lines and proceed to blast through the mercs on the way to help Garrus. He's pretty happy to see us, I think. But he's also never been one to throw down his weapon and hug Shepard, despite what fan art might tell you. The reason that he's doing all of this seems to be out of frustration towards the Alliance and how horrible the justice system is in his eyes. We'll talk specifics later, but for now it's time to blast our way out. Well, doing so has us hiding behind a wall and shooting down at shooting gallery pop-ups for the next eight minutes or so. It's, uh, it's not very enticing gameplay, and it goes on for way too long. But eventually, the mercs breach the bottom level, and I take Grunt to go clear them out. From here, it's pretty standard combat. It's a lot of fighting, and it makes me actually wish that I had worn my bug armor. Anyways, we gotta shut some shutters, move back up, take out the Blood Pack boss, take out the Blue Suns boss, and eventually this fucking Halo-ass vehicle comes flying in and just lights Garrus up. I love this scene because this isn't one of those things where it's like, oh, gee whiz, Shep, that sure was close, but my shields really saved me there, haha. <laughs> no, it looks like he dies, which is where the Mission Complete window pops up. It's actually the first time that I felt like the Mission Complete sequence felt like it belonged, and I understood its purpose. Though to be fair, it's less of a cliffhanger when a fucking achievement pops up telling me that I successfully recruited Garrus. Yeah, obviously he pulls through, though not without some new scars along his face and armor to show for it. They did what they could, but you're gonna have some scars. I'm sorry. Ah, uh, probably for the best. Everyone was always ignoring you and hitting on me. Time for you to get a fair shot at it. So like I said, that's all for our recruiting spree for now. Our next mission has the elusive man calling in to tell us that the human colony of Horizon has gone dark communications-wise, meaning that the collectors are about to strike. So it's time to bust ass down there to try to prevent another abduction. Well, the collectors do get there first, as a cutscene shows our boy Caden making his second game debut by attempting to shoot a swarm of insects while shouting, I'll cover you. You'd think he'd opt for biotics here, but hey, who am I to judge? As a side note that has to do with the remaster here, take a look at the difference between the skin textures between Caden and Girl Victim Number 2 over here. It's kind of funny how much that shit sticks out when they cut corners on certain models. So fighting our way through Horizon has us encountering our major enemy of the game, despite what the Blue Suns would have you think. 
The Collectors can fly in, deploy portable shields, and have a penchant for sending the same zombie-like husk enemies from the first game at you. They also have this commander-type thing called the Harbinger who can take over the soldiers on the field and supercharge them, which usually happens once every battle. I think my favorite part about this whole ordeal is the fact that these colonists are all frozen, and Miranda's like, hmm, seems like they're still conscious, but they can't move due to the stasis field. And meanwhile, I'm just running through bunker after bunker where these people live and just hacking their computers and safes for credits. It's kind of funny how that doesn't net you renegade points here specifically. At any rate, we wind up finding out about the Alliance coming here to install some defense towers for just this occasion. Except they never got the targeting systems working to make them useful. Does the Alliance do anything? I mean, I guess they just have a lot of people. I'm sure they do some things but it feels like they're almost always just this massive source of incompetence. So now we're off on that goose chase to get them functional. The fights here get pretty intense, but still manageable obviously since I'm only playing at normal difficulty. Eventually we hammer the collector ship with the defense system, which takes off with half of the colony in tow. Everyone else is freed from their stasis, including Caden. You would think that this is where we hit him with that, you son of a bitch moment with Guile's theme from Street Fighter II playing in the background. But instead, Caden's pissed off that Shepard's alive again because his feelings got hurt when Shepard didn't call him right after being resurrected. You know, I generally enjoyed Caden's demeanor in Mass Effect 1. He wasn't a great character to talk to, but he wasn't bad either. I enjoyed him. Still, I didn't expect to outright dislike him in this game. I had Ashley alive when I played through previously and the dialogue is fundamentally the same with some differences based on whether or not you romanced her. Now, I understand Ashley being hurt here in the case where she was romantically involved with Shep because he didn't even try to contact her. That part definitely makes sense over Caden. But even then, she goes, hey, I hate aliens as always, but Cerberus, those guys are fucking extremists. Like every iota of her character is pivoted towards the idea that an all-human group who puts human interests first would be the greatest idea in the world to her. But Cerberus is too much for her for some reason. Even when her long-lost love turns up with them and explains that he's just using them as a means to an end. I know some people are gonna be mad with me about my takes on Ashley, because I do know that her character does evolve eventually to not be so xenophobic, but Every single time I talked to her about aliens in the first game, she kept saying that humans should look out for themselves and not worry about stuff like that. I know that this changes, I think, if you romance her, but I have not seen that side of her. I'm only judging her based off of what I have seen, so I, I don't know. What I don't get here is that both her and Caden regard you as the greatest human to ever grace humanity, more or less. And yet they both go, yeah, I don't know, I think you might have been brainwashed. Which, yeah, sure, I guess that's an okay thing to jump to. But they were both basing this off of the fact that they believed that Cerberus was the one abducting human colonies. Like, that's literally what they tell you. We set up defenses here because we were sure that it was Cerberus that was doing all of this. Well, guess fucking what? Those insects that just crawled up your asshole and paralyzed you probably should have been a pretty damn good indicator that maybe this one isn't on Cerberus. I just don't get why you would sacrifice Caden's character to instead be a spiteful piss baby because Shepard didn't reach for the closest space cell phone to call Caden immediately. The Cerberus angle does make more sense for him to dislike, and I actually agree with the idea that he might not join up because of it, but it still seems to me like Ashley should have had the option. I guess the devs just wanted to write fundamentally the same story with this particular instance. At any rate, we're back on Collection Quest 2010, as the elusive man congratulates you on saving half a colony and gives you more dossiers to wipe your ass with. Before we can capitalize on this new intel though, Admiral Hackett from the first game has finally caught up with us. I know I never really mentioned him in detail, but he's the guy who generally hit you with an onslaught of side missions. I mean, he does more than that, but that's basically what I remember about him. Well, he has another one, which is funny because the conversation didn't go, oh, hey, Shepard, glad to see you alive, and instead has him Preston Garveying at you with another settlement needing our help. All right, that is a little harsh. 
No, he actually does have a side quest with a pretty decent background story. That isn't just something like, hey, a colony's radiator broke and we think it's the Krogan probably. Instead, he claims that a personal friend of his who was in deep cover out in Batarian space got caught and imprisoned after stating that she found a Reaper artifact that signals immediate Reaper invasion. This is especially interesting because the Alliance has been outright denying that the Reapers were going to continue their onslaught, probably to ease the public into a state of ignorant bliss. It's an interesting way to frame a mission, and I actually like this setup a lot, especially since Hackett asks Shepard to infiltrate the prison alone with no backup. But we'll set that aside until way later and go to pick up Tally for now. So Tally's out here trying to investigate this system star which is dying at an alarming rate, causing it to leak dangerous radiation. And likewise, this is also causing anything on the surface of this planet to just fry in the sun. In Mass Effect 1, when you went to a dangerous planet like this, Shepard would auto-equip a helmet. It made sense and I was all for it even if I would rather see his face clearly during cutscenes. Now from my knowledge, I think most of the rest of the game, Shepard does actually equip a helmet when he's in a dangerous area or someplace with no oxygen or whatever. So maybe this one's just a fluke. But as things stand, Shepard's out here turning his newly reconstructed face into a charcoal briquette because I didn't equip a helmet. Oh well. So yeah, this planet's quirk is that the direct sunlight drains your shields, which I actually found to add more to the immersion of being on a dangerous planet, and likewise appreciated. What I didn't appreciate was that Tally's squad got pinned down by the Geth, and then a chunk of it got squashed by a pillar, which is fine in and of itself, but then it's like, oh no, we gotta blow up that pillar to get through. Uh... We could probably either like squeeze by it or climb over it. It's not like it's a tall pillar. Like if one of us just boosted two of us up, then we could pull the first guy up and just be over it. Like this is just lazy from a game design perspective. I guess it's a lot easier to have a perfectly rectangular piece of geometry fall right where it needed to go, but Jesus, really? Either way, we fight our way through and blow up the pillar with a laughably dramatic explosion. Send it to the sky. We might want to move. Our girl Tally has been mentioning Shepard throughout her research logs here, explaining how she wishes he was here, which is adorable. When we finally get to a communication terminal, we explain the situation to her, and she lets us through to extract her. After we make it past some Geth Prime units, we wind up meeting with the guy overseeing Tally's protection detail, who's pinned down by a gigantic Geth unit. This is actually a really cool scene, as the battlefield is described in detail by Cal here. It's a war zone that feels a lot more like a real battle more so than anything else that we've been through so far. This is actually a weird point of order, but when you first encounter the Quarian race, it's through Tally. They all have these very distinct names, usually with apostrophes partway through them. Likewise, Tally tends to speak in this very, Jesus, I don't know, Eastern European kind of dialect. Now, mind you, the lore reasons for her even speaking English is that she has a real-time translator attached to her suit getup. So her speaking like that gave me this idea that Koreans tend to speak with that same kind of dialect due to their native language being translated into English. Here's a small snippet of how she talks. The effect is similar to when stars blow off mass to enter a red giant phase, but Haystrom's son is far too young for this to be natural. Now compare that to Cal here. Callie's inside over there. Geth killed the rest of my squad and they're trying to get to her. Best I've been able to do is draw their attention. The difference between these two is staggering. And realistically, yeah, sure, humans speak with different dialects all the time, right? I mean, I just used one as a comparison. But would it result in these drastically different languages being translated into different dialects as well? I don't know, maybe. It's not like the voice acting is bad. In fact, I like Cal Rieger's voice acting quite a lot. It just stuck out to me as a really weird phenomenon that Cal sounds like an American drill sergeant while Tally sounds like you plucked her straight out of one of the countries on the East European border. And this extends to quite a lot of the other Quarians that you wind up meeting throughout the game, male and female alike. It's just kind of odd, and like I said, it's not a huge issue, but it really stuck out to me here. Anyways, we fight our asses off through, again, a pretty damn cool battle. I enjoyed this a lot. It's probably one of the first times I had a bit of fun with the combat. 
even if it was more or less the same kind of ordeal. Maybe it was just the music. Either way, we defeat the Geth here before grabbing Tally, who's very eager to join us on our suicide mission after her fleet sent her on a different suicide mission to figure out why the sun was dying so fast. Don't forget to introduce yourself to Edie, the ship's new artificial intelligence. I love this little detail. The fact that the Geth were created after their AI went rogue, and Jacob decided to say that, is something that Tally's not going to jive with in the slightest. We'll... we'll talk about her more later. I'm getting tired of saying that. Our next stop is Ilium, which has a fuckload of things to do, including picking up two more crew members. Ilium is rad, and is probably one of the most fleshed out areas in the entire game. As much as it looks like a clean utopia of commerce, it's probably just as crime-ridden, if not more so, than Omega. It's just white-collar crime. Aliens are everywhere shouting about stocks, making purchases, gossiping about sex, selling slaves. It's about what I would expect from a galactic marketplace on this scale, and I enjoy exploring it quite a lot. Tally tells you that it's one of the best places in the galaxy to be if you're rich, which is some dialogue that's promptly cut off by an Asari who waves me down. I wish games would let a sentence finish before triggering another, but I guess I get it. The Asari is someone who encountered the Rachni Queen from the previous game, the one who I let go on Noveria to rebuild her species. She talks through the Asari, claiming that she'll be there with her Rachni army to help against the Reapers when the time comes, which is an awesome continuation of a choice that I made in the first game. Speaking of first game choices, let's meet with Liara at last. Much like Tally, when we first met Liara, she was very much a super intelligent but woefully naive woman who was still trying to figure out her way in the galaxy. Now... Have you faced an Asari commando unit before? Few humans have. I'll make it simple. Either you pay me, or I flay you alive. With my mind. Yeah, she's a badass now. This is a great change in my eyes, as I never saw too much of a difference in character between Liara and Tally. But now Liara is an information broker who's as cutthroat as they come. Of course, asking her to join us is fruitless, as those same connections that she's made has caused her to become bound to her job. Likewise, she already needs me to do something in the form of hacking a few terminals for info around Ilium. I just like that I'm like, hey, tell me why you need me to do this. And she says, I can't. I'm always being listened to and recorded. Anyways, go illegally hack all of these terminals for me, please. Yeah, okay. Pressing Liara for info about our next two crew members has her pointing us towards them, so let's get to work. First up, we have the assassin, Thane Krios. Thane's on a job to kill someone who we actually know from Mass Effect 1, Nasana Dantius. Well, we don't know her. I never even said her name. She was kind of just a side mission, but still. Basically, she had you going to rescue her sister, only for it to turn out that her sister was blackmailing Nasana and threatening to expose her vicious nature to the Citadel. If you wind up going through with this mission, Nasana pays you handsomely for killing her sister. I actually never did this mission in my previous playthrough, but I again love seeing the continuity here between entries. It really makes the series stand out more as something special in my eyes. So it's up the towers, fighting off mercs which Nasana has hired. When we make it to the top, Thane Krios drops in and takes out the whole room with deadly efficiency. I like him. He's, uh, an interesting counterpoint to Zaid. Whereas Zaid is more about taking a job for money while performing heinous acts without batting an eye to get the job done, Thane is more about using his assassination expertise for good causes. As always, we'll talk about him more later. But for now, Thane takes the job free of charge, stating that he's dying and that he wants to make a good impact on the universe before he goes. Now, I will say that when we make it back to the ship, Jacob gives Thane the third degree. He does this whole, hmm, I don't trust an assassin. They only want money. My guy, we paid Zaid so much fucking money to be on this boat. Why are you piping up now? Fucking stupid. Anyways. Let's nab our next and final member of the crew for a very long time. So it's back to Ilium where we purchase some upgrades, free a slave, hack terminals for Liara, and talk to an Asari matriarch who's tending the bar. Dad was a Krogan who fought in the Rachni Wars. My mother fought in the Krogan rebellions. 
I've pretty much seen it all. Thanks for telling me about that. Eventually, we make it to an officer here to inquire about our second to last piece of the puzzle, the Justicar. It's explained to us that Justicars are powerful Asari warriors who do everything in the name of justice. That they'll die for an innocent and kill anyone that they deem to be corrupt. That they would follow an oath which they would die before breaking a lot like a paladin. That they're more or less religious in how adamant they are about striking down anything that they perceive as evil or unjust. It's probably a good thing that we hacked those terminals for Liara before mating the Justicar. So we head off to another part of Ilium where a crime scene awaits us. The Justicar is further in, interrogating the shit out of some mercs who may have smuggled her target off-world. This is Samara, and she's every bit as pure and holy as she presents herself to be. She tells us that she's willing to join us, but that she has to get her mark first. Unfortunately, the disturbance that she's caused here has the police needing to take her into custody. She goes, All right, I'll go for you for one day because my code requires me to cooperate with you for that long. Her code sounds like made up bullshit to me. I mean, yeah, it kind of is. But what a specific section of a code to have. I'll cooperate with the police for one whole day, but then after that, I'm killing some bitches. Right. Anyways, we gotta go track down her target while she's in custody, which sounds about par for the course. This little pine cone out front seems to know how to get to the Merc base, so we ask for his cooperation. This conversation is actually a prime example of Bioware dialogue. Basically, you have this little walnut breathing at you and telling you that he doesn't know anything. A renegade option pops up. I don't take it. I instead say, hey buddy, we should be working together since some mercs are after you. If you help me out, I can take them out. And he's like, oh shit, yeah, that's a great idea. So far, so good, right? Well, there's a point where Shepard goes, you're gonna help me get into that base. And the talking crockpot goes, well, I did make a copy of the key. And Shepard does this. It's like the conversation was definitely geared towards intimidating this dude in the writer's minds here but they didn't want to force the player. Yet the knuckle cracking really stands out as a weird sequence break after Shepard smooth talks him. Oh well, it's not the end of the world. To be fair, I did get to relive one of my favorite encounters in this game right after this. I am a biotic god. I think things and they happen. Fear me, lesser creatures. For I am Biotic's made flesh. You need help. You need help. The leader of these mercenaries is in the next room. I will tear her apart. My Biotics are unstoppable. Charge. I'm tired. I'll nap. Destroy the universe later. But yeah, more fighting, evidence collecting, and 40 XP side quest pickups. At the end of the rainbow lies Samara, who goes, hang on, let me respec my paladin oath here, and basically changes from following her code to following anything Shepard desires, which again, sounds like bullshit. But she did say that she'll kill Shepard after they deal with the Reapers if he makes her eat his asshole or whatever, so I guess that's neat. Honestly, it just makes me want to go into a grocery store and grab all of the honey bunches of oats off of the shelves before walking out and claiming that my code demands it. But either way, we've got our final crew member for a while, and we can move forward with the story. I'll probably start looking at evaluating every single crew member at this stage besides the last one, just because we're over an hour in and I still haven't mentioned them in detail. There's a lot to most of these people, and there's a lot of them in general compared to, say, Mass Effect 1 or Dragon Age Origins. Also, this is one of the only things that I plan on saying about the Legendary Edition specifically, but the fish in here are just high-definition paper cutouts of fish. You'd think they would have mustered some 3D models. Oh well. All right, before we move over to the whole crew evaluation thing, let's hop over to a quick word from today's sponsor, Displate. So you ever look at a large, unwieldy slab of metal and wish that it was functionally easy to handle, had the ability to hang on walls with magnets, and featured sick art from various forms of media? Now that's a relatable circumstance that I think we've all found ourselves in during our lives. Fortunately, I've found a solution in the form of Displate. 
Displate is a company that specializes in grabbing metal, cutting it into fashionable rectangles, and printing high-quality art on it that is tailored to fit any apartment entryway, basement man cave, sprawling manor hallway, or my personal favorite, right above the bed to watch over you like a dream catcher. I decided to position my boy Roach watching my back, Luigi's Mansion to watch over my dog, Vivi to tie the room together, and the Beast to ward off intruders. It's a motley crew, but they really make my two-room apartment feel more like a grand art showcase rather than the recreation of the casting couch room. Every once in a while, I decide the dog needs a little bit more protecting, and I grab the beast and move him because it's really easy to just move these things around at will with the magnet system that they have in place. Anyways, this stuff is all pretty simple. If your art taste buds are as good as mine, you'll head over to my display page and check out my pics with the link in the description. If for some reason my pics aren't vibing with you, you can also just browse through Displate's massive amount of artwork until you find something that really fondles your heart and stimulates your mind. From there, you can order whatever you want, receive it, slap on these little stickers that are easy to peel off and leave no residue, and then attach the magnets. Guess where the metal goes? That's right, the magnets. Metal sticks to magnets. Well, okay, smartass, not all metal sticks to magnets, but this one does, trust me. And that's it you now have one entire art hanging from your wall. Now you just have to do all of that for any other art you might have purchased. If you use my code, you can grab your displates for an up to 29% off discount that activates once you add the displates to your cart. The code is active until a distant time in the future that will be added to your screen. So be sure to pick one up before then if any of this sounds like something that you need in your life. Thanks guys. So let's talk about our crew now that we've got everyone assembled here. The biggest thing to note is that where Mass Effect 1 was generally pretty good at spacing out the conversations throughout the game, many of your crewmates would almost immediately just start spilling personal info out to you. It wasn't poor spacing by any means, but it was definitely a lot at once. Mass Effect 2 tends to follow this same kind of process, except with your crew being even more rigid towards you at the beginning when you first meet them. This rigidity does actually make the relationship regression feel a bit more realistic. But it's kind of thrown away when a character starts spilling their guts out to you about everything on their minds immediately after being really cold towards you. Now mind you, this isn't always the case, as some outliers do take their time to really get to know you better, and in those cases it feels really good to finally chip away at their armor. I found that the ones that usually had better pacing were the non-romantic interests. When things are kept professional, it doesn't seem unreasonable for a personal matter to come up suddenly, and for them to have built up enough of a rapport with you to trust you with the personal info. When things are suddenly advanced from cold and distant to romantically charged, however, it does seem a bit fast. I think a lot of small talk needed to be added to make this stuff feel more organic. Now, I do also think that with the amount of moderate to major missions in this game, Having every single member have something new to say to you every single time is going to get exhausting. So really, something between these two would probably be perfect in my eyes. Just a conversation about favorite foods or activities or something innocuous like that might make for a good way to feel more connected before the crew member opens up. But either way, let's jump in so you can see what I'm talking about here. Basically, I'll be giving feedback on each character and explaining how I feel about how well written they are, in addition to hitting their loyalty missions. Jacob Taylor is easily one of the most likable characters from the get-go. He's honest with you, direct, and shows a lot of respect for your accomplishments. He openly admits that Cerberus has done some seedy shit in the past, and that them being branded as terrorists up until this moment is an accurate assessment but he's also fed up with the Alliance being slow to react to threats, and wants to take this journey with Cerberus to help be a part of the organization turning over a new leaf, and putting an end to the Reaper threat. He says all of this pretty openly, but doesn't want to talk about himself for a bit, stating bluntly that he doesn't want to force small talk with you. I respect it. When he does start to open up a little more, it's about his disdain for the Alliance. I have to admit, I like the flaws that the Alliance has. Like, it's very realistic. They're the good guys. They stand for equality among alien species. They have this bastion of technology and civilization as their main hub. But they're also steeped in bureaucracy at nearly any given moment. They sweep good soldiers' accomplishments under the rug when it makes them look bad. They tend to have a prejudice against humans because they're the latest race to join them. 
They never even admitted to the public that Shepard was dead, instead taking a computerized image of him and his voice and using him for recruitment ads to join up with the Alliance. It's fucking crazy how treacherous they are, but they're still the good guys. It's just very realistic in my eyes, and Jacob's really good at conveying that through your conversations together. From here, you kind of learn about Jacob just a little bit at a time. I'd say that he's probably the best paced character here in terms of how measured his responses are. You can ask him basically one thing about his personal story every time, and he'll answer it before saying, all right, well, that's enough for now. What he says isn't revolutionary, but it is nice to hear about for a bit. I will say that eventually you're just gonna be hearing him tell you that he's not ready for more small talk repeatedly until his personal mission comes up. Every member has a loyalty mission which causes them to further bond to you if you decide to go through with it. Jacobs relates to his father, who was serving on a ship that went missing 10 years ago after staking out an uncharted planet. Well, someone forwarded Jacob some intel which showed that there was an active distress beacon going off from his father's ship, despite it being nearly a decade later. Jacob's not sure what to make of this, as it seems like Cerberus is somehow manipulating him with this information. As Jacob puts it, Cerberus usually only looks out for what's in its best interests. So for this suddenly to pop up now after nearly a decade is kind of weird, especially when it was brought to him personally through a private connection. Jacob's not really even worried about his father, as the guy wasn't in his life for a very long time now, but his curiosity is eating at him more than anything else. So this entire thing is a gigantic mystery with a pretty fun premise. You begin by heading to the ship wreckage and stumbling upon a VI module which isn't functioning at full capacity. It notes that Jacob's dad was promoted to acting captain when the original captain died, in addition to stating that the local flora causes brain degradation when ingested. It takes seven days for this degradation to begin, which is likely why they didn't notice it at first. Well, the mystery doesn't lie dormant for long, as it soon becomes very clear that Jacob's father forced the women here to eat the brain degrading flora while he kept all of the ship's supplies for himself and his officers. They assigned women to certain officers, killed off the rest of the men, and soon after started killing each other. It is fucked. But I love how ridiculously cruel this all is as a horror story of a couple of individuals capitalizing on tragedy to fulfill their twisted fantasies. It kind of reminds me of Lisa in a way. Or maybe Lisa reminds me of this. I think I'm pretty sure this came out first. Either way. Of course, there was a logical reason behind this at first. While Jacob looks over the logs, he notes that only a handful of people would have the know-how to fix the beacon which led us here. If they happen to be the male officers, well, it would make sense for them to keep the real food to themselves, so that they could work on getting everyone else off the planet. But as things got worse and worse, the officers took advantage of that mental decay. And even after the beacon was fixed in the first year, it wasn't triggered until much later. Though, who knows if the officers were as bad as Jacob's father, or if they were just going along to get people off planet and not actually doing anything to the women. Because right after the beacon was fixed, every officer was killed within a week. This leads to the question, why would Jacob's dad ever set off the beacon if he held out for nine or so years? Well, because the surviving men who escaped the initial slaughter have begun forming hunter societies to kill him. It's so fucked up that I can't help but applaud the writers here. I absolutely love this side story. So eventually we start storming our way through Mr. Taylor's defense force of mechs and guards. All along the way, he's paging us over the comms. Oh, thank God you're here. Oh, don't mind my mechs, I needed them for self-defense. Oh, I'm so glad you're coming to rescue me. And when we finally reach the bastard, he barely reacts to his son, and not because he's been eating the flora. He has nothing but justification for his actions instead, claiming that mutiny had begun to surge through his ranks and that the flora seemed like the easy way out. He claimed that ignorance was bliss when it came to the brain decay and that it made things easier when it came to ruling over his crew while the beacon was being rebuilt. When the time came to activate it, he didn't know how to explain that he had created a fantasy fuck zone of women and instead decided to forego it. The thing about Jacob's dad, though, is that there's hardly any relating to him beyond this basic outline. He's an asshole through and through. Every answer that he gives is monstrous and inhumane towards the treatment of others. Jacob calls him out every time and he doesn't even respond to him. 
it's not hard to understand what the right choice is here, because Jacob's dad might as well just be a dummy made of straw. So we have him locked up and the rest of his former crew rescued, though that's about all the resolution that we get here. Jacob's obviously pissed about the situation, but he's already made peace with the man that he regarded as his father a long time ago. It's not my favorite conclusion just because we don't get to see the man tried or anything of the sort. We just head back and find out that Miranda was the insider who told Jacob in the first place. But Jacob is appreciative and the quest is wrapped up. All in all, Jacob is the epitome of a soldier who wants nothing more than to serve his captain and humanity. He's not a bad guy in the slightest, but his character isn't necessarily strong enough to make me love him. I do like him though, and I think that he's a great addition to the game overall. So Miranda Lawson exudes bitch power, and it's 100% intentional. She's the opposite side of the coin from Jacob in that she's also blunt and direct, but she's more about getting things done and not about socializing. At least, that was my initial assessment of her. When you meet her on the Normandy for the first time since your very first mission together, she immediately explains that she understands if Shepard's skeptical of both her and Cerberus. So she offers a token of information to help ease Shep into the idea that she's only here to help him as the elusive man has directed. This information, however, is less about getting Shepard to trust her and seems to be more of an excuse to gloat about how perfect she's assembled to be. And I do mean assembled, as she basically lists the cavalcade of modifications, education, and training that she's received to help her perform better than the vast majority of humans. It's a rocky start in terms of her being likable, but I definitely am much more intrigued than I ever was than Southern Comfort in Mass Effect 1. It is worth noting though that from here on out, Miranda is generally pleasant and is nowhere near as cold towards Shep, which is a bit jarring from the initial encounter. I mean, maybe it was just a bad day for her with the whole robots taking over her station thing. Well, eventually we get more into the nitty gritty of who and what Miranda is, which makes her 100% more likable. She's dedicated herself to Cerberus because they took her in after she escaped from her father. Basically, her father created her by using his own genes exclusively, modifying his Y chromosome with specific traits to craft his daughter into the powerhouse that she is. Eventually, through her training and education, Miranda came to realize that she was nothing but a tool for her father and wound up running away to Cerberus. It's weird because while I enjoy this twist and I do like Miranda much better now, it happened so immediately after meeting her. I mean, this is basically right after I recruited Morden. She went from being this ice queen to opening up about her greatest insecurity, and the transition in comfort levels is enough to give you whiplash. This is especially bizarre when you complete a mission or two and afterwards she's like, eh, I don't really wanna talk right now. I mean, I guess you could view this as her regretting opening up, but it feels more like her declining small talk should come before spilling her guts, not after. Honestly, had they just given her a line of dialogue where she says, hey, sorry, I haven't really been talkative, I just feel a little weird about saying all of that stuff about my father so quickly, then this would have been a brilliant way to frame these conversations. But that's not the case here, as the next time that she does want to talk again, it's directly about another large facet of her life. I guess this is my issue with how Bioware has set up a lot of these characters. It seems like they basically had a quota. All right, first we gotta have the initial dialogue where they reveal a small snippet of their personality. Uh, then we gotta have the bigger dialogue. Then we gotta have the mission which relates to the bigger dialogue. And then they become loyal to Shep and we have the conclusion dialogue. Like there's not a moment where Miranda is hanging around the lounge or just chilling out and looking out the window. There's no point where we have some small talk about some aspect of life. It's just, oh hey Shep. I work for Cerberus. Ha, ha, I am a genetic anomaly. My father made me in a lab. I'm in the top 1% of humans, and now I have a big problem. It moves fast in terms of jumping from big plot point to big plot point. And again, as weird as it sounds, this game needed a little bit more filler dialogue to make these interactions more organic. Either way, Miranda's mission involves her dad finally tracking down her twin sister. Her twin was living a normal life with a family under Cerberus' protection. But her dad finally tracked Miranda's sister down and is now trying to capture her on Ilium. So Cerberus is trying to move her family off of the planet, and Miranda wants to go supervise the move to make sure that nothing happens to her sister. So you head over to Ilium and meet up with your contact, who tells you that Miranda's dad is one step ahead of her. 
so they moved her sister with a trusted contact before we got here. Miranda seems okay with this information, as she really trusts the guy who her sister went with. Which, I mean, that pretty much spells betrayal, right? At least this one is hinted at pretty heavily almost immediately after this, as the mercs who were hired by Miranda's dad state that this guy wouldn't be helping us. This whole conversation is a little weird, much like Jacob's was when he confronted his father. Basically, the Merc leader talks shit, right? And Shepard responds by asking a question. And then the Merc leader continues to talk, and then Miranda goes, Ha ha, not today, asshole! Or, Ha ha, we're still gonna get my sister! But the guy doesn't say anything to that because it's Shepard's turn to talk next. It just doesn't feel like the natural flow of a conversation because it's almost like they built it to happen around Shepard and then shoehorned in Miranda because it's her mission. Anyways, turns out that Miranda kidnapped her sister when she was still a baby. So they aren't twins by the normal definition, or the only definition really, but they are twins on a genetic level. Check out how jostled this scene is. Hang on, I've got one of their radios. I'll patch us in, see if I can get an idea of what we're up against. Shepard, I think I owe you an explanation. Okay, so they start out with this almost sexualized portrayal of her walking up to the radio and bending over to pick it up. Like she's gonna step on it, or grab it and say something to them like, you're next, or whatever other cheesy movie line they could fit in here. Instead she goes, well, I got their radio, Shep. Uh, why'd you walk up to it like that? Then right after this, she's like, sorry I didn't tell you about my sister, Shep. It's like two back-to-back -back scenes which both felt like they were going to go somewhere completely different. At any rate, you can grill Miranda for more information about this friend of hers who has her sister, right? And the game doubles down on the idea that this Niket guy would never betray Miranda, which is really weird to me. It's like one of the writers went, well, if we bring up the idea that Niket took Miranda's sister, wouldn't the player immediately suspect him? And the other writer went, hmm, well, what if we, uh, what if we just have Shepard ask Miranda about it and then she can tell him that he's 100% trustworthy no matter what? Well, surprise, Niket is trying to turn her sister over to Miranda's dad. It just seems kind of like a lazy way to deflect player suspicion rather than write Niket in as someone who you meet up with and is actively trying to help Miranda to get her sister out of there. Only to betray her right at the end by revealing that he had been piloting them towards her father the entire time. I do have to admit that at least the writers made a decent recovery here by having Miranda talk about her relationship to Niket while we take the elevator. She explains that he knew what she went through and that he never betrayed her back then either. But then she goes, well, he only found out about my sister recently. Well, gee, do you think that maybe there's a connection? Like, that's the main issue with this writing is that it reflects more on Miranda's gullibility as a person rather than Niket's mastermind-level betrayal. I get that there's a human connection there, but for someone who was so cold and contained at the start of the game, she sure has a hard time realizing that maybe there was a reason that she didn't tell Niket when she took her sister right away. So this whole shit show kind of slides downhill even more from here. We get to the area where Niket is trying to hail a cab and the confrontation goes down. Niket, of course, takes the line of, hey, helping you escape is one thing, but you never told me you stole your sister and joined Cerberus when you eventually did tell me I took your father's money to get her back. And Miranda's like, so you just took his money then, huh? And he goes, you've taken his money for years. Bitch, what? She was born and raised by him. What was she supposed to decline it at the age of five onwards? And then Niket goes, well, I haven't told your father that I found your sister yet. So it's like, huh, I guess we just kill you then. Of course, Shepard gets the one of three Paragon flavors that he gets repeatedly throughout the game in the form of, no, don't shoot him, you will regret it. And then the Merc shoots Niket anyways. Cool. When all is said and done, Miranda goes, I cannot believe I did not realize Niket would betray me. He was my only friend. Even with all your upgrades, you're human, just like the rest of us. I'm only human after all. Good God, this is a lame ass mission. Either way, we go and see Miranda's sister off. I convince her to talk to her. A wordless scene is shown in which BioWare does its damnedest to outclass Bethesda facial animations, and we ship out. 
I wonder what she said to her. Uh, hey there, I'm your twin sister. I've been looking out for you my whole life. Oh my god, I can't believe it. You truly are my sister. I don't know, whatever. She's crying about it, I guess. Must have gone well. I, I think. It's, uh... Yeah, okay, it's a pretty shitty loyalty mission. And it really reflects on how poorly Miranda's character is written in my eyes. Like I said, she starts out as this badass operative, this confident, cocky soup of biotic genius and experimentation. Then she shows a more human side, and that is completely fine. But then that human side completely overtakes the supposed perfection that she was meant to be just for this story to be about how even lab-grown humans that are destined for something greater can make mistakes. And I don't like that because it took away that badass factor from her character. She can be both, you know. You can have Niquette betray her in nearly the same way, but have her catch on to it immediately, and still have her tell you why she wouldn't have suspected the betrayal. But instead we get this sappy, kind of overblown story where Miranda learns what it's like to be imperfect like the rest of humanity. And it doesn't resonate at all because she's been a pretty nice and courteous person this entire time. It's like they designed her to be more heartless. And then they came up with Jack and they went, well, I guess we can't have two of them running around even though they totally could have had two flavors of Icy Hot on the ship, and then had each develop in opposite ways. Like, they could have kept the story the way that it was had they made her more frigid the entire time. Or they could have kept her as the courteous and nice person that she has been, but changed her mission. But what they chose was something in between, and it just doesn't work out in my eyes. There is one more thing that I want to talk about, and that's Miranda's ass. I know that seems like a weird thing to transition into, but OG Mass Effect players will know that the devs really focused some camera angles on Miranda's cheeks for a very large chunk of her screen time. Perhaps I wouldn't mind if you admired my body. What is this angle? No other character has this, and I'm pissed about the lack of Garrus ass. There was actually some outcry about them taking some of these butt shots out of the Legendary Edition, which I completely understand, because the ones that they left in still stick out like a sore thumb. I'm glad Niket tried to redeem himself. I'm not sure what the original Bioware guys were going for here, but her ass is almost fetishized at times with the way that the camera focuses on it. And I do have to admit that taking some of that out was a good call in the Legendary Edition. The only reason I'm mentioning this is because I almost feel like like they were substituting character for sex appeal at times, and it led to scenes like Miranda bending over to pick up the radio in her mission. I know that seems like a deep read and we'll probably never know if I'm right, but it was gratuitous at times, and I can tell because it was one of the first things that I remembered about Miranda when I saw her. At any rate, I think that's about all for Miranda. She can be romanced, which I'm not particularly interested in doing. It's funny because I chose her the first time around, so maybe all those ass angles really did something for my 17-year-old self. But she's not a horrible character, just not a great one in my eyes. Especially when compared to the rest of the cast. It felt like the devs got a little confused when writing her. And that confusion led into this weird, watered-down shadow of what they were trying to go for. They wanted to do this whole, Oh, Cerberus saved her, so she's blinded by that. And she believes that Cerberus has changed for the better kind of thing. And I'm all for that kind of flawed character being presented in the form of someone who has produced to be perfect. My issue is that it only seems skin deep with Miranda. For someone who's so cunning and intelligent, she really misses the forest from the trees frequently. Which is again fine and probably what the devs were going for when writing her. It suits an icy demeanor, and it would be great for someone who couldn't empathize with the imperfect people like Jack. But then she's suddenly this insightful person who understands how others feel, and goes out of her way to do things like figure out where Jacob's father is. I feel like I understand what the devs were trying to go for here, but it really all comes down to the fact that Miranda just doesn't have enough screen time and player interaction for the complex personality that they were trying to go for here. It'd be like if Morrigan was this really bitchy character for the first conversation that you have with her, and then suddenly she cared about you, only to flip-flop between those two personalities for all seven or so conversations. At any rate, I'm gonna move on before I harp on this for longer than I already have. So both Zaid and Kasumi are unique in that they both kind of fill you in about how they think and what they're about via their surroundings and memories. Each of them have their space on the ship, and they kind of just hang out and talk to you about whatever objects you look at in the room or whatever lessons that they've learned in life. 
or stuff that they've heard around the ship. You don't talk back, it's just you listening to them. It's hard to say if this was an intentional decision or if it was just laziness in terms of coming up with more dialogue. I mean, they were both DLC characters, I believe. But either way, Zaid is fucking scary. Much like Candorus, he only seems to care about the missions which he's completed, the dangers which he's delved and lived through, and the credits which he's been paid. Of course, this is pre-Mandalore KOTOR 1 Candorus, mind you. He's a pretty heartless and self-centered merc who cares only about himself and getting the job done to an unapologetic degree. Even going so far as stating that he totally gets why Jacob's dad did what he did. You kind of get the feeling that Zaid isn't supposed to be extraordinarily deep when he describes the saddest moment of his life being when he retired his old rifle. So the focus shifts from, huh, I wonder if he secretly fights for someone else or if he had a sad childhood, to, I wonder what war stories grandpa will tell today. And they are good stories. It's fun to listen to him and then eject cubed garbage in the back of his quarters. But I mean, that's really it. He doesn't get much deeper and that's completely fine by me. There's 12 damn comrades in this game. We don't need all of them to be the next Harry Potter. Get a knife stuck in the right way and you can pull that plate right off a of Krogan's head. It's the best way to get a Krogan to talk. The threat of it drives him mad. Likewise, Zaid's loyalty mission doesn't come from constant communication and him opening up to you. He actually brings it with him upon recruiting him, stating that he has another contract which he hasn't yet finished. So we get dropped in on this predator-ass jungle planet against the Blue Suns. We're after the co-founder of the whole gang, who's revealed to have started the Suns with Zaid. Eventually, this Vito guy got it in his head that this badass motherfucker wasn't good enough to lead. So he had Zaid tied to a chair and shot him in the head. Yeah, it turns out that's not enough to kill him. Rage is a hell of an anesthetic. Now there's a very interesting point of order here. Our original mission here is to save the workers here who are being repressed by the Blue Suns. But obviously Zaid does not give a shit about that. So what does he do? Have a change of heart when the heroic Commander Shepard tells him to save these workers over pursuing Vito? Nope. If you decide to save the workers, Zaid is pissed, making it very hard to convince him to continue being loyal. On the other hand, if you do chase down Vito, Zaid's content. It's actually something I'm really happy to see, and it's a complete change of pace. I'll give you a little spoiler here with these loyalty missions. They tend to wind up with the person loyal no matter what you choose to do. Even with Garrus, whose entire purpose is to kill a person, he'll still be loyal to you if you stop him from killing the person. Now, mind you, it is possible to let Vito go and talk to Zaid about the decision, eventually persuading him through some tough dialogue choices. But it's not easy and it shouldn't be, because Zaid's a fucking dickhead, and I love that they stuck with that here. Likewise, I said fuck the workers, which is an experience in and of itself as you hear these screams of dying workers as you storm the suns in pursuit of Vito. Eventually, you get your guy, and Zaid turns the fucker into kindling. I absolutely love it. Overall, he's a good side character. He's not the main focus, and that's good because he doesn't need to be, honestly. It's a good portrayal of the classic mercenary type, and I'm glad that Zaid made the cut. Like I said, Kasumi follows in Zaid's footsteps in that she won't talk to you directly in one-on-one -on -one conversations, and instead just tells you about her stuff. She seems like a kind-hearted thief, one who has a soft spot for romance and books and children. This is, of course, based off of the romance novels and the painting that was painted by a child. Yeah, Kasumi's boring. Where Zaid brought the ruckus with his tales of war and bounties, Kasumi's like, I'm bored. Did you know I'm a thief? I can hear everything from this room. Have you seen The Office? Hey, got a minute? Not a lot of people go in and out of Dr. Chakwa's office. Gabby and Ken would make a great couple. I'm not used to hearing my footsteps when I walk. She's just a filler character in a bad way, completely opposite of Zaid in my eyes. I just don't get it. It's like they had a quota. Well, we had six party members in the first game. We have to have 12 this time and make them pay for two of them. I have to say, that Jacob, mm -hmm. he seems pretty intense. I wonder if he likes Japanese girls with a pension for kleptomania. I guess my main beef is that her dialogue gets recycled almost immediately. I talked to both her and Zaid after every mission, and I didn't get a repeat in dialogue from Zaid once. 
I got repeated dialogue with Kasumi after about three missions. So what's there to do for a loyalty mission? Well, a big ass heist, of course. Now I love this setup because I'm a pretty basic human. Show me a heist and I'm ready to team up with three others and inevitably get caught by security. Now the problem is that for as great as this setup is, Bioware tries to ham fist an emotional backdrop to it. Oh, my former lover got killed by this guy and now I wanna go rob him and steal my former partner's gray box back. Oh, a gray box is a tool used to capture memories and the like. It's like a thumb drive. But the issue here is that Kasumi has this story that would actually make you care about her if there were any lead up to it. If she wasn't a piece of cardboard staring out a window of the ship. If your relationship with her wasn't as one-sided as they came. The problem is that her former lover was actually showcased in one of the comics which released uh, three years after Mass Effect 2. So at the time of release, we had no context for this whole ass human which we're supposed to care for. It's everything that Zaid's mission did, but poorly. At any rate, we go to this event which the target is hosting, presenting ourselves as some higher up so-and-so who dabbles in illicit activity. The target is, uh, something about his accent really bothers the shit out of me. I thought it was Scottish, but then it kind of sounds Australian at times. Is there a problem here? Yeah. And though I've heard a lot about you, you've been very busy lately, if the extra net is to be believed. I don't think our guests would come all the way here from Ilium just to cause trouble. If any of you could identify this accent, I would be grateful. Anyways, I get a voice sample, grab some DNA, get the password, and cut the power to the vault. The mission shakes up the mechanics a little bit, which I appreciated. Though a lot of it is business as usual, especially after we suit up and enter the vault. If I were a more vindictive nerd, I'd angrily shake my fist at this darkspawn ogre statue over here. But I'm not, and I think it's neat. Anyways, this mission actually goes on for a lot longer than you would think. And as you fighting through wave after wave of mercs after our target decides to tron himself over this big ass projector. Then we get out to the roof where he jumps in a Hind D helicopter to gun down Solid Snake. Then Kasumi mounts the craft like a Covenant Banshee. These are all references, congratulations. It wasn't a bad mission though, all things considered. When everything is wrapped up, Kasumi sifts through her dead lover's gray box for all of the memories that he had, along with the dangerous information which got him killed. He fused the two together, so if she ever wanted to expose this intel to the world, she'd have to show footage of them fucking. Weird. His final message to her tells Kasumi to destroy all of the data, to which she declines fervently. Now I could destroy all of the data myself, and then Kasumi wouldn't be in danger. Or she might want to see us fucking. I really pile drove her that one time. She's gonna love that. I clapped some cheeks. She's gonna want to see that. But I'm also gonna fuse all of this data together with it, so she'll just have to memorize the vicious fucking pounding that I gave her. You can convince her to keep it or destroy it. I decided to go with keeping the sex tape. Now all things considered, this is a touching moment. But again, our context stems from this entire mission. There hasn't been any back and forth to really understand what exactly this person meant to her until this quest. And I'm not a big fan of that. Now I will say that it helped her to become a better character in my eyes, and maybe that's what should matter here. But I still have a hard time ranking her above other more fleshed out crew members. It's not that she's a bad character, it's just more that she's bad when compared to the rest. Either way, it was a fun mission, and I do think that she adds something to the game with this context. I've obviously introduced Morden a little more than the average crew member at this stage. Talks fast, short bursts of sentences, tends to build himself into a frenzy, talking faster and faster until <sighs> he stops abruptly. But personality-wise, Morden is very much both intelligent and wise. He knows how to take care of himself and sees people's intentions almost immediately. He was part of the Solarian Special Tasks group, the same group who we assisted on Vermeyer and Mass Effect 1 to take out the Krogan cloning facility. This killer instinct which is embedded into Morden makes him a very tough customer despite not looking like one. It's such a yin and yang scenario with the guy. Because on one hand, you would think that he'd be a bleeding heart, peace and love type of guy with just how adamant he is about saving lives. But he's just as likely to kill people on the spot if he deems them to be a threat to him or others. 
It's all extremely cold and calculating, and it's really fun to listen to him talk. The matter of fact talking extends naturally into the Krogan genophage, which we talked about quite a lot in the Mass Effect 1 video. But as a brief recap, the Krogans got a little rowdy and started rebelling. The Turians had to go shut them down, but did so with the help of the Salarian scientists who invented a genophage to make the Krogan fertility rate drop severely. When Morton refers to this genophage, everything that he explains is very on the nose and direct. Stating that the Special Tasks Group has been monitoring the Krogan population ever since then to basically make sure that they remain controlled. It's fucked up, but I also understand the idea of Krogans multiplying at an alarming rate to be... terrifying. The issue is that Morton very much has decided that he knows exactly what the best course of action is in regards to the Krogans. Their threat to him is far too great to not control. And while he doesn't want to see them all dead, he does want to see them curbed as a species. It's a very unemotional, direct, and cold position to take. He even explains that the first form of the genophage was actually overcome by the Krogans naturally through evolution. So he helped to develop and spread a new and more potent version to keep the Krogans down. Like, that's how confident he is in the idea that this is best for the Krogans, best for other races, and best for the universe. It's a little scary. Not a war criminal. Not a murderer. Genocide. Unnecessary. I do like Morden as a character, but I usually wind up choosing to butt heads with him over his emotionally lacking responses at first. He holds firm for a while, and has no doubt in his mind that he knows what's best here. Unfortunately, he doesn't really develop in a more endearing direction until the next game. But that journey does take root in this one when he hits you with his personal mission. Basically, a student of his who assisted with the genophage modification has been taken hostage by Krogans on the Krogan homeworld. This is a great development story-wise just because it's probably the worst possible emotional scenario that could crop up in Morden's otherwise cold and calculating life. It definitely fleshes him out more as a character, and soon we find ourselves on course to the Krogan world of Tuchanka. Tuchanka's a fucking shithole, but goddammit, it has the best character in the franchise sitting on its throne. Have I mentioned just how much I love Rex? I promise I have. Your reforms will not go unopposed. You risk appearing weak at a critical time. Shepard. Good enough? Excuse me. <laughs> Out of my... Shepard. My friend. I couldn't help but grin like an idiot when I saw this big lug smacking heads around like the alpha that he's always been. Since the Normandy got blown to shit, our guy has seized control, united the clans, and has begun the process of repopulating by establishing a neutral zone for non-violence and breeding. Of course, some of the lesser Krogans have taken issue with this as he broke a fuckload of traditions to get his way. But he's still accomplishing what he set out to do. And I love catching up with him. Oh yeah, Morden. Right. Morden. Shit. So Morden's student has been taken away by the Blood Clan, which have been trying to cure the genophage by experimenting on humans. This is actually more of an interesting point than I thought it would be, but Morden points out that humans are the most genetically diverse of the known species. That everything about them has a set of complex variables which outpace even the Asari. It's an interesting point to think about because obviously most people are going to look at these alien creatures and think, well shit, these guys have way more going on than humans. But it's a lot like the old D&D trope of humans being the most well-balanced and adaptive race out of all of the fantasy races. Either way, according to Morden, their experimentation has sound grounds for curing the genophage. And they seem to be a lot closer than anyone would have guessed. This leads us to meeting a speaker of the clan who comes out to tell us to flee and spread word that the Blood Pack will rule over all in time. This is probably one of my favorite Renegade moments just because it's so goddamn brutal. See? The human cannot hit a simple target! Goddamn, son. Well, after this, we encounter more data that Morden begins poring over. Standard treatment vectors. Avoiding scorched earth immunosuppressants to alter hormone levels. Good. Hate to see that. We actually do learn a bit more about Morden's ideologies here when he insists that he helped steer the genophage into something that would cause steady growth over time. And it's not hard to understand his point of view. 
On the surface, and from how the Krogan tell it, the genophage was a blight created to eradicate the Krogan population. Morden, on the other hand, insists that all life is precious, that the rapid expansion of Krogan would endanger all life if left unchecked, and that the genophage could have been easily modified to completely sterilize the Krogan and cause them to die off entirely. Instead, he likens it to gardening, controlled, careful population increase that would maintain the species at a natural level. It's a great point for his character regardless of how you personally might feel about him tampering with nature, and it makes it much harder to fault him for doing what he did. He goes on to state that he'd be very open to the Krogans uniting under a single government, claiming that they were the ones that saved the galaxy from the rampaging Rachni a while back. He explains that this desolate world of Tuchanka had become this way before the Krogans even met the Salarians when they started warring with each other using nukes. And he concludes by stating simply that the genophage was never meant to be a punishment, just something necessary to save the Krogans from themselves and save the galaxy from the Krogans. I like this development a lot, and it's quite possibly the only real answer that Morden could have gave here to make him come out as the good guy in any capacity. As much as I love the Krogans, I have to say that I understand why things came to the conclusion that they did. This continues on when we find the bodies of dead female Krogans who willingly gave their lives during experiments. Morden mourns their loss, lamenting the fact that he inadvertently caused this, even dipping into something akin to Hinduism in a prayer for the dead Krogan. It's a powerful turn from the usual direct and calculating doctor who created something as galaxy-shaking as the genophage. Modified Genophage Project great in scope, scientifically brilliant, but ethically difficult. Krogan reaction visceral, tragic, not guilty, but responsible. Trained as doctor, Genophage affects fertility, doesn't kill, still caused this. Hard to see big picture behind pile of corpses. Continuing on, we find a sick Krogan who was captured from Rex's camp. He's basically given up on being useful in life since he's smaller and wouldn't be able to fuck the females usually. Instead, he's submitted himself to experimentation here as a way to help his people. If you want to help Erdnot, you need to get back there. But it would take a real badass to make it back to camp while injured. I can do it. You? I said a badass, not some scout whining like a quarian with a tummy ache. I can do it. I'm a... and I'm going to the female camp. Damn right you are. Get back there and show them what you're worth. Go, go. Roar! God, I love Krogans. Big old sacks of meat with brains. Anyways, get ready for some heavy shit. When we reach Morden's student, it turns out that he chose to come here willingly. But why? Never argued with necessity of genophage. How was I supposed to disagree with the great Dr. Solus? I was your student! I looked up to you! Yeah, Malin here felt like what they did to the Krogans was a mistake, likening it to genocide even if it only affected birth rates. He makes some very solid points, claiming that the Krogans could have exploded in population, gotten more rights from the Citadel, and eventually would have been ready to face the Reaper threat, even potentially preventing what happened on Eden Prime in the first game. While all of this is supposition, as Morden puts it, it does seem like a possibility. Morden's insistent, though, stating that they ran the simulations over and over and only projected increased violence and war based on past Krogan population explosions. It is a brutally tough argument to choose a side on, but ultimately Morden moves in to kill his former student, meaning that I don't get to choose a side here. I always gotta side with Morden, but you know. I stop him with a Paragon option and he reassesses before we send Malin packing. From here, you can decide whether to keep the cure research for the future, potentially, or to destroy it. But the main thing that Morden learned here is that not everything is so black and white as he initially perceived it to be. He's an incredibly intelligent being, but that intelligence sometimes leads to moments like this, which is something that he's now trying to come to terms with. You're really at peace with what happened? Yes, of course. Can't change what happened. Life continues. Back to mission, back to work. Become like Malin, otherwise. Well, that was fast. All in all, Morden's a good guy with some moral boundaries that he's crossed. The entire experience here has taught him a lesson which carries over into the third game in a pretty huge way, which I liked a lot. Later on, he claims that the Salarians effectively ruined any chance for the Krogans to evolve when they showed up on their planet and gave them access to spaceflight and nuclear weaponry. 
Actually, that's a really interesting point of order. So, earlier on, Morden said, Oh, the Solarians showed up and the entire planet was destroyed by nukes. It was already destroyed. This was the first time that we ran into them and it was already destroyed. They just blew themselves up with nukes. And then later on he goes, Oh yeah, the Solarians came by and they gave them access to nukes and space flight and all that shit. So I don't know which one it is, but the game does say both of them. He claims that if they had just left them alone instead of recruiting them to fight the Rachni, the Krogan people would have likely worked through their caveman aggression and flourished as a more intelligent and less primitive race. For now though, Morden is content with being his Solarian scientist self, and will continue plugging away at whatever scientific or technical issue may arise next. I'm sorry, I know that was important, but you performed Gilbert and Sullivan? I am the very model of a scientist Solarian. I've studied species Turian, Asari, and Batarian. I'm quite good at genetics as a subset of biology because I am an expert which I know is a tautology. My xenoscience studies range from urban to agrarian. I am the very model of a scientist Solarian. Like I said, I love Grunt. He exudes this pure intellectual prowess that oozes danger. Whereas you knew not to fuck with Rex because he had a wealth of experience and fighting prowess, Grunt feels like keeping a fucking Dragon Ball Z villain on your ship and hoping that he doesn't get bored. One of the first things that he determines besides his own name is that Okir's imprint failed. He doesn't care about the plight of the Krogans. He doesn't care about some legendary legacy which was chosen by the Krogan gods. He just wants to fight, win, and prove that he's the strongest around. As such, he naturally doesn't have much to say to you about anything at first. But when he does, he immediately spirals into identity crisis. Which makes sense, he's a week or so old and learned everything he knows from having pictures beamed directly into his head. Depending on where you take Grunt and what you do with him, he does gain respect for Shepard pretty quickly as a warrior. This is seen particularly when you're going after Garrus on Omega when the Krogan leader of the Blood Pack wants to know why Grunt is following Shepard around. He sticks up for Shepard here, hailing him as the best warrior that he's ever seen. Which isn't, um, saying too much considering Grunt's age, but I'm sure Shep is happy with the compliment. The main issue Grunt tends to struggle with is finding a purpose, what it means to be weak or strong. He bats ideas back and forth about whether the dead are weak or strong whether he's strong because he was made this way or weak because he doesn't have to work for it. It leads him to wanting to find a purpose, something to care about. Like he mentioned immediately, he doesn't care about the plight of his people, but he figured that if he was manufactured to be the strongest of them, then he should start looking into a reason to care and try to force himself to do so. This leads to a handful of aha moments for Grunt, as he begins making bold statements in an attempt to understand what he should be doing in life. It's like watching a teenager start to go through their rebellious phase, but like in a really direct way. Like you walk in on Grunt one day and he's just like, guess what Shep, I'm racist now. Well eventually our guy hits the apex of his puberty and is getting ready to start crossing that one PUBG bridge that made PewDiePie say the N word. But before things get out of hand, we dial up the ship's AI who tells us fucking nothing. So we gotta go back to Tuchanka to sort this mess out. Well, Grunt is about as impressed looking at Tuchanka as I was, but that's to be expected. I mean, he's practically like the equivalent of a rich kid showing up and looking at what all of the poor kids do all day. And he's about to face another harsh reality, that no one respects him as a purebred, top of the line, state of the art Krogan. Most of the others besides Rex instead see him as an abomination to be purged. Rex, on the other hand, is willing to give him a shot since he's with Shepard. I didn't mention this before, but it is worth noting that another Krogan will be the leader here if Rex died in Mass Effect 1, which probably shifts quite a bit of the dialogue here. Either way, Rex confirms that Grunt is going through a bout of adolescence and that he should perform the rite of passage to become a part of Clan Erdnot in order to feel fulfilled and transition into adulthood. One last thing to note here before we go see the Clan Shaman about Grunt performing this rite is that Grunt actually is bigger than most if not all of these Krogans. It's actually a really smart design because his body is huge, 
but his armor is stout compared to these massive heaping hulks which most Krogans seem to sport. So this other Krogan shitstain is pissed about Grunt's existence and runs up to the shaman first to tattle on our boy. The cool thing about Krogan culture here is that you would think that at a glance, they'd be all about showing off solo skill and willingness to destroy. But the shaman makes a good point in that a Krogan should be able to inspire the allies around him to prove that he can bond with a clan and make them stronger. It makes perfect sense and it adds yet another chunk of lore that makes me love these big ass lizards more. My followers are true Krogan. Everything about Grunt is a lie. You, you dare. <laughs> I like this human, he understands. This big piss baby then rescinds his denial of the right and tells us that we'll pay for me giving him an owie on the head. Let's get this test over with. So the right has us fighting in three rounds of combat against native species of Tuchanka. It's kind of a cool test, as you power this big ass battering ram into the earth to send out a shock wave which attracts the enemies. The last round has a thresher maw springing up to wreak havoc on us. Technically you're only tasked with surviving for five minutes, but we take it down pretty easily since it's not hard to cheese it. I probably could have managed without the cheese, it just went faster to do that. The piss baby from before shows up after this and is impressed, asking Grunt to join his clan. Grunt denies him, which leads into one more battle in which we wipe the field with these idiots. All in all, it's a pretty damn cool trial actually. I had a lot of fun with the whole thing, and it felt awesome to help Grunt become part of the Erdnot clan. Grunt's obviously stoked about being a part of the clan and has now begun listing all of the different alien species that he wants to murder in gruesome ways, which is just so wholesome. I think the most interesting quality about Grunt being the way that he is is that it isn't done super frequently in media. You might see some old warrior who was created or raised in an unconventional way, who had to take baby steps to get to how knowledgeable and wise they are in the future. You might get a glimpse into the past of a wizened old man, which shows them fucking up or questioning themselves, before becoming that wise and strong. But rarely do you see someone who was created to be perfect, has the intelligence to understand their lot in life and their emotional desires, but are still so immature that they can't quite grasp what it is that they want. When you look at Grunt and listen to him trying to figure all of this out, you can very much see these glimpses of brilliance these sparks of someone who's going to be a fearsome warlord or an amazing commander. But Mass Effect 2 is just the beginning of that. Where Zaid is the surface level look at a grizzled mercenary type, Grunt is an in-depth look at someone who will become the grizzled mercenary type. I know that some probably wish that he would continue to deny his heritage and become an interesting spin-off of what a Krogan is and should be, but I don't personally see the reasoning in that. It would be like writing a human character to have the aspects of an alien who doesn't care about humanity. I mean, sure, you could write someone that way, but what would be the point to it other than to make them different? And even then, usually people that don't care about humanity tend to be, I don't know, more evil, at least in humanity's eyes. Whereas someone who starts off that way and eventually embraces what they are is, to me, a lot more of a relatable character progression, even from a human perspective. And it is a really cool thing to see unfold, even if it does wind up with Grunt being yet another Krogan. <laughs> see, now we're having fun. Me remembering good deaths and you with your, your funny human thing you're doing. Jack's intro was pretty cinematic and it sets her up to have a pretty bombastic character. I know I introduced Miranda as the Ice Queen bitch, but holy shit. Jack is intentionally this way and gives no fucks. Likewise, her and Miranda tend to fight like cats and dogs. She's also extraordinarily aware of Shepard being nice to her as a means of getting her to be friendlier and to get along better. She knows what she was recruited for and she won't respect Shepard until he's earned that respect. Of course, giving her access to the Cerberus database is a great step in that direction. You see, Jack was actually raised in a research facility by Cerberus. She escaped when she was young and has been just causing havoc around the galaxy ever since. But she's not looking for answers as to why or how she came to be in the care of Cerberus. She's looking into anyone who ever messed with her in any way so that she can kill them. 
I find that to be a much more interesting trait as opposed to the more cliche route of, I must find out about my past and who my mother was, and all that shit. She's confident in who she is, and she only trusts in her own strength, but that's kind of because she has to have been to have gotten as far as she has in life, and she's gotten very far. She's went through her phases of fucking and taking copious amounts of drugs. She joined a cult and decided that she liked the haircut they required. She's committed just about every single crime that you can think of. Murder, extortion, vandalism, theft of a military vehicle. She's basically a fucking GTA character. But she's really fun to talk to and I like listening to her because I'm never quite sure what she's going to say next. Hey Shepard, no one's ever asked me about this shit. It's strange to talk about. So fuck you, and thanks for asking. Something interesting that happens right after you recruit Jack is when you get pulled aside by the ship psychologist. She claims that Jack is gonna be the perfect soldier on the battlefield, that she won't break, but that she has deep emotional trauma that's going to cause her to be unstable outside of combat. Likewise, Jack doesn't put any stock into having sex as an important event. The psychologist warns you that if she does offer sex, that Jack will respect Shepard more if he declines her. This actually turns out to be very true, as Jack is down to fuck pretty early on after meeting her. If you choose to do so, then you won't be able to romance her later on, which is a nice touch. It's a realistic reaction for someone to have to this situation with the personality that Jack has, and I really have to applaud the writing here from Bioware. When the conversation option did come up, Jack had basically just ran through what her tattoos were about why she doesn't trust people, and why getting close to anyone is only going to get her killed in her eyes. She's survival of the fittest in every sense of the term, and it makes getting actually close to her a lot harder. Well, not really. Again, as with Miranda, a lot of the surface level toughness gives away to personal detail sharing almost immediately. There's no phase where Jack distrusts you enough to not talk to you about personal details. She's basically an open book, but I admit that this does work better with her personality of not giving a fuck better than Miranda's personality. Either way, I chose both options revolving around the potential sexual encounter to see how they'd play out. The first one has Jack asking if Shepard is only being nice to fuck her, and Shepard says that he wants to get to know her better before moving further. The second one has Shepard quite literally grabbing her by the pussy and going to town. All right, Jack, I like how you move. In Dragon Age Origins, I was kind of put off by the music during sex because it felt a bit cheesy. Yeah, check this one out without the music. Come here. I did not feel good after that. So yeah, I'm gonna go with the respect women route, I guess. Well, after this, Jack starts to unravel a bit more since she's on a Cerberus vessel. She explains her past, how she was raised in a Cerberus cell. They tortured her, kept her locked up, and got the other children who were there to hate her. They claimed that this was to weaken any mental barriers in order to create a stronger biotic. Well, they got what they wished for as Jack eventually did awaken her terrifying power and just annihilated everyone in her way, both the guards and the other children who attacked her. Eventually, she drifted far enough in her escape pod to get picked up by a freighter of people who she claimed used her before dumping her elsewhere. It's some of the most heartbreaking shit that you'll hear from this series, and it really makes me feel for this spiny, pissed off girl. I want to go to the center of the place myself. I want to deploy a big fucking bomb, and I want to watch from orbit when it goes. Hell yeah, we can do that shit. Let's fucking do it. So we land on this jungle planet that seems to be undergoing a perpetual monsoon. The facility that we infiltrate still shows signs of damage from when Jack made her big escape, with a defective hologram at the front replaying the same message. The message states that the elusive man would kill the team working here if he knew what was happening but that he wouldn't care as long as they got results. Further in, Jack explains that she was periodically let out of her cell to fight against other kids. She would get shocked when she held back. She would have narcotics automatically injected directly into her veins when she attacked. Yeah, that's one of the most fucked up things I've ever heard. 
As we make it further in, another hologram has a panicking guard claiming that the kids were rebelling, to which Jack cuts in to tell Shepard that that's a lie, that all of the kids attacked her along with the guards. But there's more. There's a log which explains that the other kids were being experimented on right alongside Jack, and that they underwent more dangerous treatments which killed a lot of them. There's another log explaining that this entire facility was a disaster, and that they would have to move back to an Alliance school for biotic children. Shepard explains that they definitely do not torture kids at the Alliance biotic school. Basically, all of these logs are semi or completely counter to Jack's view on things. And now you're starting to wonder if this maniac's views on what happened here were real, or if she's always had mental issues and was receiving treatment and care for it here. Even Shepard starts going, well, things were kind of going crazy and you're probably just misremembering. But all of this is a red herring. And I'm not sure why, because the writers had something big here. The whole time you've been rooting for Jack, trying to get to know her and help her despite how prickly she is. And that's naturally going to endear a lot of people to her as a character. Then you show up on this facility and you keep finding out these little breadcrumbs of information. That she misremembers something that changes her entire perspective on things. That the other kids were just as miserable and were dying for the sake of making her stronger. That they rioted with her and inadvertently freed her only for her to kill them all. And this is a pretty decent story in and of itself. It's just a subtle twist, sure. Nothing wrong with that, right? But what if you had it so that Jack was actually being taken care of for a disease that she had or a mental problem? What if the doctors weren't treating her poorly at all? What if no one was getting tortured and that perspective on everything that she had was just a result of her own psychosis or because of some side effect of the treatment? I feel like there really could have been an oh shit moment here which led you to choosing to kill slash abandon Jack or to forgive her and to help her heal. But either way, the way that they wrote it wasn't bad by any means, I just felt like it could have gone better. They did kind of ramrod this other guy in here at the end though. There's another kid who somehow survived the carnage and he grew up all fucked up too. He hired some mercs to come clear out this place and rebuild it so that he could figure out why this research was so important that they would torture kids for it. Jack throws him on the ground and gets ready to execute him. And you can push her to let him go if your paragon is high enough, or you can choose to have her kill him if your renegade is. Then this shit happens. Oh yeah, I'm sure he got far enough away from that one there, Shepard. What a paragon you are. I don't know, I felt like this guy showing up at the end with the mercs was kind of just half-assed and more for combat than anything else. It's almost like, you know how nearly every modern Bethesda quest has to involve you running through some cave and fighting some dudes and getting a reward at the end? It's like that but with mercs that you have to fight in Mass Effect. I don't know why that just clicked with Jack's mission, but I think it had something to do with the fact that we were supposed to be clearing out a facility that's been abandoned for many years only to find it filled with mercs for some fucking reason. The worst part about it is that they could have just gone with the original idea of let's have some wildlife running around here. Well, whatever. Right after this, a scene plays out in which Miranda and Jack are about to fight or fuck and we haven't quite determined which one yet. Joker sends Shep to go figure it out and it looks like fighting is the winner so far. Apparently, dumbass Miranda is continuing to tread down the I have no idea what kind of character I want to be path because she's gone from the mission is the most important and we all have to get along to look at this greasy bald skank. She deserved what happened to her because Cerberus definitely wouldn't do anything like that. Are you fucking kidding? I really do not understand this writing for Miranda because again, this would have been completely fine if she was always super icy but she's been pleasant for 90% of my time knowing her, especially when her being pleasant affects the Cerberus mission. And now she suddenly goes down the number one Cerberus fangirl path and starts verbally harassing someone who literally has the capability of tearing the fucking ship in two instead of holding her tongue for the sake of the mission. Honestly, it just paints her as more naive than anything else, as she again sets herself up for betrayal despite literally just experiencing it firsthand with Nickel back on Ilium. Sorry, this is about Jack, I know. Her resolution to all of this is messy. It's tough for her trying to get her head on straight after going through what she's gone through and being what she is, which is completely understandable. 
she is at least able to acknowledge that she probably isn't going to be magically cured and that she still lusts for violence. It is good writing, even if her mission was just only decent. Of course, she's our second romance out of the three, which has us having to confuse her further in order to get to that point. It's kind of fucked up, actually. But it's not like you can bluntly state that there's no way that Shepard would fall in love with Jack. It's just more fucked because he's very coy about it. It seems less like a, Jack, I'm in love with you, and more like a, so, you love me, huh? Guess you'll have to figure that one out because I'm hard and ready, baby. I don't know. I'm not opposed to the relationship. I'm just opposed to how it's presented like a bad Star Trek fanfic. Either way, progressing further with Jack has her really starting to open up to you. Telling you about someone who loved her once before he got himself killed while sacrificing himself for her. It led to a tremendous amount of survivor's guilt for Jack and probably caused her to become even more fucked up. You know what it's like? think you're alone and find out you're not? Pretty much, yeah. You don't have to agree so fast, you fucker. Jack's a complicated character, but a good one. She's entirely different from everyone else, even though Miranda seems to start along the same lines. She knows what she is and she takes pride in it. I like her a lot as a character, and while I wish I could get a little more insight into her feelings, I understand why she's so closed off at times. Unfortunately, I think the only way to get closer to her inner thoughts is romancing her, and I would rather go for Tally here at the end of the day. Obviously, I won't be running through Garrus's whole background the way that I would with a member who wasn't part of the first game. In Mass Effect 1, Garrus was very idealistic with the way that he approached everything. He believed in justice among all else, but almost to a naive point of view. He wanted to cut through the red tape of bureaucracy to make sure that justice was served, which is why he joined Shepard in the first place. When Shepard died, Garrus immediately fucked off to Omega to make a difference there. He began righting any wrongs that he noticed, and soon attracted his own mercenary crew of 11 others to him. He was all about helping the defenseless and taking down the corrupt, which is just such a Garrus way of thinking. It almost seemed like a form of therapy for him, to be honest except then things went wrong. Eventually, one of his own sold out the rest of his Merc squad, which wound up with all of them dead besides Garrus and the guy who sold them out. So now Garrus is on the hunt for yet another person who escaped him and fled the galaxy, which mirrors how Dr. Hart eluded him in the first game. The problem with Garrus is that you can tell that these things really bother him, obviously, but he hasn't quite learned how to approach them in the smartest way yet. In the first game, he was very much an ambitious young man who followed Shep around to learn how to take action, more or less. I mean, it wasn't his only reason, but it was one of the big motivators for him. He felt dismayed at the idea of C-Sec being weighed down by the process, and immediately jumped ship when he could to the Normandy. In this game, Garrus seems wiser for sure, and he definitely knows how to fight and get things done. But he still hasn't slowed down to acknowledge and understand his own feelings. Or at least that's how it seems to me. C-Sec sucks? Go with Shepard. Shepard dies? Go to Omega. New crew dies? Chase the Betrayer. Like, I've never heard a moment from him where he goes, yeah, I kind of reflected on my life for about a month, or anything of the sort. I mean, sure, he blames himself for his crew's deaths, but it still feels like something's missing in how he thinks and acts on things. Likewise, his loyalty mission pops up with little to no conversation in between picking him up and receiving the mission. And as mentioned previously, he's after the guy who betrayed his team. Most of this has us running through a factory to get to the guy who helped Garrus' target disappear. Ironically, the guy who did that is Harkin, who's the person who pointed you towards finding Garrus in the first game. It's kind of a full circle thing, as Harkin has now turned to crime after being fired from CSEC. Well, when you get to him, you kind of see just how far Garrus has gone down the vengeful soul path. He's definitely not the bright-eyed and eager Turian with big sweeping ideals, and he's now willing to kill this guy if need be to get his answers. I stopped him from shooting Harkin in the leg, and I actually kind of felt bad about doing it. This character development isn't evil, it's just more ruthless. And likewise, Garrus grumbles to me about not letting him shoot Harkin. But we get the info and go to meet up with his mark, which has me distracting him in a public area while Garrus lines up a shot from afar with his rifle. It's a great scene which gives me the option to warn this guy about Garrus if I so choose. But I obviously don't do that, instead letting Garrus take the shot. It's kind of weird that it was set up for Shep to keep him in one place, 
but then he goes, you're gonna die, bitch, and lets him see Garrus from afar, but whatever. Garrus gets his guy, feels no regrets in the slightest, and puts a bow on who exactly he is now. Talking to him really lets you get a feel more than ever about what Garrus is and who he is. He's snarky, sarcastic, but extraordinarily faithful to Shepard. I couldn't do this without you, Garrus. Sure you could. Not as stylishly, of course. He's a good guy who just wants to see the galaxy rid of evil, and he's incredibly good at doing it. He admits that an average Turian would follow an order no matter what, even if they knew it was bad. But he figures that there's no point in not letting his voice be heard if he hears something that he doesn't like. He's a great character who doesn't need to talk a lot to let you know what he's about. And watching him transform and shift ever so slightly from game to game is a really fun thing to witness. The devs did a great job with not making him too sappy or unlikable with his zealousness. I mean, shit, he's basically Space Batman. Likewise, I wouldn't put him in my top characters, but he's definitely not anywhere near the bottom for me. This recon scout and I have been at each other's throats. Nerves, mostly. She suggested we settle it in the ring. I assume you took her down gently? Actually, she and I were the top-ranked hand-to-hand -hand specialists on the ship. I had reach, but she had flexibility. It was brutal. After nine rounds, the judge called it a draw. There were a lot of unhappy betters in the training room. We uh, ended up holding a tiebreaker in her quarters. I had reach, but uh, she had flexibility. More than one way to work off stress, I guess. Tally's obviously another previous member who knows Shepard well. When you initially met her, she seemed like she was tagging along to be on a big old adventure, what with her pilgrimage and all that. She had an almost naive understanding of the universe, while also being incredibly intelligent. In this game, she's definitely matured over the past two years. Leading expeditions and conducting research for her migrant fleet of Quarians has hardened her a bit to the realities of the galaxy. She doesn't trust Cerberus, but she does trust Shepard, which only further hurts Ashley and Caden's characters in my eyes, as they couldn't extend him the same courtesy. This is even more fucked up when you realize that Cerberus tried to send in a ship filled with explosives at the migrant fleet in order to retrieve one escaped biotic user who was hiding out with the Quarians. The plan ultimately failed, but it left another smudge on Cerberus's reputation as alien-hating fanatics. This was actually something that took place in one of the novels which released after the first game, but Tally mentions the incident when joining. I just don't understand how she's able to put that in the past and join Cerberus, but someone like Ashley just can't get over it with Shepard, even when she was a love interest. Either way, talking with Tally initially has her expressing her concerns about Cerberus, which makes complete sense. At this stage, your Paragon option continues to push the idea that Shepard completely expects Cerberus wants something and isn't telling him. Well, it's something that I take issue with in regards to how the game is presenting the seemingly inevitable path. Because let's put this out there now for those of you who are still in the dark. Cerberus does want something more. There is a reason that they brought back Shepard beyond saving the galaxy but they had so much more potential when it came to building them up as an organization who turned a new chapter in the galaxy. Initially, they're very vaguely presented as a kind of, we're not like that anymore, group. They did horrible shit, and they seemingly want to atone for that by stopping the Reapers. And that's a great redemption story. But you know what would be even better? If they presented themselves this way the entire game. Lobbying for Alliance Trust, showing that Shepard is working for them and winning human support, letting Shepard do all of the hard work to prove to other species that Cerberus is the good guy now. But instead, this new chapter is half-baked, and it quickly becomes apparent that you're now working for a corrupt organization, and that you're unsure of what it's trying to gain from you. And while it isn't the worst way to tell a story, I think that guiding the player down the route of truly believing that Cerberus is good now only to pull out the rug and have some grand reveal where the elusive man shows you everything that you did for Cerberus and what it really meant is a fucking awesome twist that would have made waves if presented correctly. But what we get instead is this kind of, eh, yeah, they're probably going to fuck us, but uh, we'll come up with something, sort of story. I know that this doesn't have much to do with Tally, but I thought that it kind of fit here. At any rate, eventually Tally's mission comes up when she's accused of treason by the Quarian Flotilla. This is obviously a serious charge, usually brought up when there's almost foolproof evidence. 
The issue is that Telly has no clue at all what she could have done to warrant such an accusation. So we ship out to the flotilla to hear what these charges are. Now I will say that this is going to be a little weird to include here because I did Tally's loyalty mission much later. But basically there's a point where we have a Geth join our crew. Bringing it along as part of Tally's mission makes it pretty different. So I chose to wait until I recruited it for this. I'll talk about it later in the video but for now you just need to know that it's there. So when we step out, every Quarian has issue with the Geth being there for some strange reason. Maybe it's the fact that they rebelled and wreaked havoc on the Quarians, but I'm not sure. Either way, smooth talking is the only way that we're keeping it with us for this. It's funny because the thing that Tally is being charged with is bringing a Geth onto the ship. She explains that she's never done that, despite being six inches away from one. It's a little fucky but she's basically been sending bits and pieces of Geth to the migrant fleet for study. You sent Geth materials back to the migrant fleet? Yeah, a little weird with the Geth that we brought on board. Oh well. So the trial begins by having Shepard lead the defense for Tally as her captain. I left parts and technology for teams to pick up. My father ordered me to do so, but I would never send active Geth to the fleet. Everything I sent was disabled and harmless. Then explain how Geth seized the lab ship where your father was working. Wow, that's about as open and shut of a case I've ever heard. Definitely wasn't any wiggle room there to implicate anyone else like, say, I don't know, her father or someone else who was working on the inactive Geth pieces. Hmm. Yep. Definitely guilty. Is there a reason we're writing these Quarians as fucking cartoon characters, or is there going to be a stage where they become average people? Anyways, I like how they break this next bit of news. Hey Tally, we're accusing you of bringing an active Geth onto the ship. Also, your father's fucking dead along with everyone else on his ship because of the Geth. You, uh, you really couldn't bring that one up beforehand, huh? I guess this is explained poorly when Tally's aunt claims that she didn't tell her so that she could have the most genuine reaction to the news and prove her innocence more. But there's still a much bigger loophole than that here in the fact that no one has any fucking idea what happened on the ship. Anyways, the trial is put on pause when Shep offers to take Tally onto the Geth-infested ship and clear it out while searching for her father and evidence of her innocence. We do learn that the Quarians are debating whether or not to reclaim their homeworld from the Geth, which doesn't seem like a good idea at this stage. But it is something that quite a few of them are hell-bent on. This leads into some dialogue with each of the judges around here who are all admirals in the fleet. The first one is on Tally's side, stating that he understands sending back Geth parts for testing their weaponry on. The second one, on the other hand, despises Tally's father because he's a Geth apologist. I made this point in my last video, but the Quarians used the Geth for slave labor because they were just machines to them. When they figured out that they could make them smarter, they did, but it also made them aware. At that stage, this scared the shit out of them. So they tried to shut them down, but the Geth wound up winning that fight. In my eyes, the Geth were just trying to protect themselves. So I don't feel super bad about the Quarians plight. I do like them, but they've always seemed a bit short-sighted to me with this stuff. Admiral Chorus here, on the other hand, empathizes with the Geth, stating that he does not wish to fight them and that he respects them as sentient beings. Now here's where this dialogue shits the sheets. This guy dislikes Tally and wants her exiled because of her father. He's a pompous prick, but his point about the Geth is something that I agree with. Now before this, the other two that we've talked to had the option to bring up the idea that the Geth actually have different factions which fight against each other some of which aren't aligned with the Reapers. And they both went, yeah, I don't give a shit, dude, they all need to die. With Chorus, on the other hand, we don't even get the option. There's no dialogue option for Shepard to go, well, actually, we agree with that. In fact, we have a Geth friend with us right now. Here, talk to him. It's a really stupid oversight in terms of the writing here, because they want Chorus to be this opposing force in this whole ordeal. If he doesn't oppose Tally outright, she has hardly any opposition here and her trial is an auto-win without gathering evidence from her father's ship. So Shepard continues to be a slightly more complex grapefruit disguised as a human, and he doesn't counter with the very obvious counterpoint that literally anyone with over 60 IQ would come up with for this instance where we have a walking, talking Geth unit posted three feet from us. 
And the funniest part about all of this is that there is one whole instance throughout this entire conversation where Shepard can bring the Geth into the discussion. And he asks about potential peace. And Chorus goes, huh, cool, interesting. Anyways, yeah, hate your guts, Tally, haha. <laughs> so it's not like this is just on Shepard's writing, it's on all of the writing here. But hey, at least we got the hilarious quib quib conversation option. Because if you can't write competent dialogue with regards to every possibility that you come up with, you might as well make light of the situation with a tee. You have a ship named Quib Quib? Oh, here we go. Anyways, the last admiral further completely makes my point by immediately pointing out that there's a fucking geth aboard the ship. Like, what the fuck? How does the biggest proponent of Geth and Quarian relations not instantaneously flock to talk to the thing that he's fighting to unite his people with? Alright, whatever, I'm moving on. The last admiral wants to return Geth to their rightful place as servants under the Quarians, which she sees as nothing more than machines to be used as tools. That's about all she has to say of importance, so let's finally hit the ship that's been taken over. So yeah, her dad's dead. And the Quarians here have been fucking with the Geth to see how to better reprogram them in an altercation. For some reason, this really bothers Tally more than when she thought that they were just using the parts that she sent back to test the weapons on their shielding and the like. I just like the idea of Shepard coming onto this ship that the migrant fleet fully intends to use after he's done, and him just looting the shit out of every safe, computer, and crate. So we get to the end of this Geth slaughtering hell, and there's this console, right? The console. The console with the very important data that exonerates Tally because that's just how video games work. And it of course has a video recording on it along with all of the research data from what was going on here. Basically, her dad was working on what was mentioned before. Seeing how the Geth network reacts to systemic attacks on their neural network and whatnot. I mean, that seems like good research to have, right? But this isn't a cut and dry set of experimentation footage. It's like the perfect video which showcases literally everything you could want it to showcase. We're experimenting here. My daughter is only sending parts. She doesn't know what's going on here. I just want to build her a home on our planet like I promised. Keep experimenting on those geth. Without my daughter's knowledge, of course, since she's aggressively innocent. I don't know how much more on the nose you need to be here, but you've completely ruined the emotional impact of this mission for me. It seems like you could have easily have presented this in chunks of information, video logs, etc., and it would have been more realistic. It's not the content that I'm upset with, it's the presentation. Like I said, this is a good reason for the experiments, even if I don't personally see anything wrong with the idea of them. I like the message that the guy just wanted to advance their research faster, so he didn't tell anyone outside of his ship what he was doing to avoid the hoops of bureaucracy in this fleet. The emotional connection between father and daughter and this guy's personal motivation is good. But when you pack it all into a 25 second video that pops up on the main console, it seems kind of fucking stupid. Tally, without this evidence, you're looking at exile. You think I don't know that? You think I want to live knowing that I can never see the fleet again? But I can't go back into that room and say that my father was the worst war criminal in our people's history. I cannot. Okay, am I just missing something here or is this way overblown? I feel like I'm missing context. The assumption that makes this line make sense is that the Koreans really never do anything to put the fleet in danger. And her father did that by not telling them that he was fucking with live Geth to try to bust through their defenses. I'm guessing that's what's happening here, but it's still kind of a fill in the blank sort of ordeal that makes this statement really stand out. Either way, we're kind of at an impasse. On one hand, I can defend Tally and throw her dad under the bus. She'll be allowed to return to the fleet, but her family name is besmirched and she'll be completely unhappy. And unloyal. On the other hand, I blame her exclusively and she gets exiled. But she becomes loyal to Shepard for his decision. But there is a third option, which requires a bit more legwork when talking to the admirals beforehand. Allowing you to rally the crowd and preserve Tally's innocence while also keeping her dad's legacy intact, which is probably the best option. This has to be one of the best instances in this game where your choice has quite a big impact on the outcome, as throwing her dad under the bus causes the fleet to start arguing fiercely among itself about how they want to proceed with the research data. 
As much as I complained about the initial presentation, this whole setup and the consequences which stem from it is pretty damn good. When all is said and done, Tally is pardoned with her father's legacy preserved. This outcome is very cute, as Tally is extremely grateful. I still question a lot of the Quarians as a people, but she's specifically a really standout member of them. I don't know, I like the Quarians a lot aesthetically, culturally, and from a lore perspective. I just don't like their decision-making and critical thinking skills. Either way, the character development from Tally is amazing. Her willingness to sacrifice her own personal standing for her father who loved her, despite constantly working for the migrant fleet and the good of her people is astonishing. She's a really selfless person whose only real flaw is her issues with accepting the Geth potentially having a faction which doesn't want destruction, as showcased later. But even then, it's kind of understandable with what her people have had to go through. She's just a very compelling character, one that you want to help and feel happy about when you do. Eventually, we get to the romance part with her, which has her explaining how syncing up suit environments with another Quarian is the most romantic thing that you can do because it signifies a desire for intimacy. I haven't trusted anyone enough for that, though, except, well, no Quarians. Um, you know what I mean. I appreciate the thought, Tally, and I feel the same way. But you don't have to prove anything to me. I know. Well, not that, that I know, but I, I didn't mean it like that. It's a, um, wow, it's really hot in here. Tally's easily the cutest and most wholesome love interest here in my eyes, probably just ahead of Thane for Femshep. And getting close to her has her trying to push back just because she's afraid she's being too selfish, which really goes to show you just how selfless she is. And I'll do whatever I have to to make this work. I, I, I wouldn't blame you if, but, oh, thank you. You don't know what that... Thank you. After this, she gets to work in researching how to boost her immune system so that her and Shepard can be intimate without her fragile Corian body giving out on her due to infection. It's adorable, and it just shows her commitment and love for Shepard more than anything else. Either way, that's just about as good of a summary as we're going to get here for now, I think. In conclusion, Tally's neat. As demonstrated before, Thane is one of the bigger forces for calm and good on the ship despite his career choice. Obviously, the first topic that you speak to him about is his illness, which isn't contagious and is exclusive to his species. As Thane explains it, the Drell race were originally from a very arid and dry home planet. They had a huge overpopulation problem and eventually wound up killing themselves over resources and the like as their planet was dying at a rapid pace. Right around that time, the Hanar showed up in space shuttles and offered to take thousands of Drell with them back to their own homeworld. The issue is that this Hanar homeworld is covered in 90% ocean, which made it extraordinarily moist and humid. This didn't sit well with the physiology of the Drell, but they were grateful to their new allies, forming a symbiotic relationship with them. They made do with what they had and constructed dome cities and homes which were more arid to help them acclimate. This unfortunately didn't stop an issue from beginning to affect the Drell, in which prolonged exposure to moisture caused their lungs to stop absorbing oxygen properly over time. This disease is what's now affecting our Drell friend. While medical advancements are being made, he doesn't believe that he'll make it to see them, slating his death date to be around 8 to 12 months from now. It's a really neat background story, and it makes me appreciate his quest for forgiveness even more as him coming to terms with his inevitable demise has caused him to join Shepard in attempting to stop the Reaper threat. But most of Thane's character seems to stem from the fact that he's a Drell for the vast majority of his dialogue. He tells you more about his relationship to the Hanar, his homeworld, and his occupation rather than his preferences in life or his previous goals. It's a lot like the amount of Asari dialogue which Liara had in the first game. Much of the intrigue surrounding her came from what she had to say about her people rather than about her personally. And it wasn't until this game that she really started to develop more as a unique individual. Eventually, Thane does begin to talk about himself a bit more, which often has him slipping into states where he spouts out his memories rapidly at Shepard. It's apparently a Drell trait which happens sometimes, and it winds up with Thane describing a hit which he attempted to perform during his assassin career. Soon after, Thane opens up about this particular phenomenon, stating that Drell have perfect memories, 
being able to recall nearly any event in their life in perfect detail, as if they were there again. This is one of those things that's scary to think about if it were something that everyone could do in real life. Imagine how hard it would be to pull yourself away from your own memories after going through a harsh breakup or experiencing a family member's death. Thane basically hints at this when he explains that some Drell would rather just lose themselves in their memories all day rather than deal with hard realities. This naturally leads into the idea of whether or not Thane felt guilty for performing so many assassinations. And surprisingly, his answer is no. He explains that the Drell tend to not always view themselves as in control of their bodies. That since he was raised to be a tool of assassination, that he blames his employers more for the deaths of others than himself. Which is kind of a convenient way of looking at it. But I'm sure you have to justify it some way or another to live out that kind of life. It's definitely one of the more fascinating races in a galaxy packed with fascinating races. And it really makes me enjoy listening to Thane's explanations. Eventually, the topic comes up about Thane lapsing into one of his memories earlier. He explains that he was to perform a hit as usual, but a bystander noticed his targeting laser from his weapon on the body of his target. The bystander threw herself between him and the target and defiantly wouldn't move, causing Thane to not take the shot. And finally, the last bit of dialogue that we get from Thane relates to his personal mission, of course. This is the only time that he really gives you a little more insight into the choices that he's made, the regrets that he has, and the burdens that he has to carry. He explains to you that he had a family, that his wife died about 10 years ago and that he left his son behind shortly after. It's actually kind of like the opposite of Jacob's mission in an extraordinary amount of ways. Jacob's dad left him and tried to escape to do his own thing after raising him for a while. He wanted his son to be detached from him, just like Thane wanted his own son. The differences here are that Thane isn't a monster like Jacob's dad, and that he didn't want his son to follow in his footsteps as an assassin. Thane thought it would be better to leave his son, even if it meant his son might hate him for it. It's a heartbreaking story, one that has the Drell reliving his last moments with his son in vivid detail. Well, as you might be able to guess, Thane's son decided to follow in his father's footsteps anyways, which Thane got word of when he took a contract out on the Citadel using the family name. Now we've got to try to stop him from making a mistake, hopefully. This has us tracking down who Thane's son is trying to assassinate, beating the shit out of a guy for information, trailing the potential target, and stopping his son before he kills the target. It's an interesting quest from a mystery detective kind of angle, but it has some kinks which should have been ironed out in my eyes. First of all, the trailing part feels cool when you're tracking your guy and updating Thane, but not much happens during it from a gameplay angle. I wish this guy would have tried to duck us a little harder, maybe blend it in with a crowd of Turians or the like. I know he's just a politician, but he also has a moment where he feels like he's being trailed. So he's alert enough to notice, but not smart enough to cover his ass better. Beyond this, the main event goes down with Thane's son just approaching the target on foot. You'd think that we could have at least picked him out or something. But it's just a hard cut to this scene where Thane's son kills the bodyguard and chases after the Turian. Eh. Eventually, we reunite the two, where Thane reveals that his wife was killed to get to him. He immediately left his son behind to kill every last person connected with his wife's death, which is kind of badass, and explains why he left his son behind. When Thane returned, his son was older, and he felt immense guilt about it he made the very human decision to stay out of his son's life, which felt like the right option at the time, even if it wasn't. Thane's son is bewildered at the cause of his mother's death, but ultimately accepts his dying father back into his life. It's a great conclusion, but I feel like it was just a little, I don't know, easy? Like everything just fell into place with a neat little bow to tie it together, as opposed to someone like Jacob's mission having a lot of lingering feelings attached to it. Like, Thane mentions that those lingering feelings are there with his son, too, but you don't really get to see them the same way. But I guess that's okay sometimes, too. Of course, the woman who stepped in the way of Thane's targeting laser back in the day to stop him from killing was his wife, who immediately awoke something in him that he had never felt. He sought her out, apologized, and eventually she forgave him. It's a touching story and extremely cute to hear Thane talk about. He's one of the better characters for me from a sheer intrigue perspective. His personality is a bit dry and direct, which makes sense for his people. But he's also surprisingly romantic at times, 
and you can tell that there's some very complex and deep emotion underneath his dry demeanor after chatting with him for only a little bit. Having him tell Shepard that he's the first friend that he's had in 10 years broke my heart. And hearing him talk about the anxiety that he has about being in open and unprotected spaces due to his lifestyle made me sad. I'm learning the virtues of facing death with others at your side. It's a work in progress. Samara is probably about 90% wisdom and 10% bullshit. I gave her grief for her code stuff, but I do respect the vast majority of what she says. I guess that's kind of what happens when you're almost a thousand years old. Also, her room is easily the best one on the ship besides maybe the captain's cabin. Could use a little better lighting for reading these books, though. A lot of speaking to her is like unwrapping fortune cookies over and over, but some of them are pretty good fortunes. Like her stating that she follows you because she knows that the collectors are a threat, and that's all she knows. When you ask her why she doesn't want to know more, she claims that if she's going to have to kill a man because he's a threat to the greater good, why would she want to know if that man is a devoted father? You got me there, fortune cookie, let's hear the next one. Nah, but Samara is initially a very private person as you might expect. She doesn't want to talk about the criminal that she was chasing because it's personal. She doesn't form opinions on things until she experiences them herself, which includes Cerberus. That one doesn't seem as wise, all things considered, but hey man, if you gotta join Stalin's personal army to know if he was a bad guy, then by all means. Of course, all of this privacy is immediately thrown out the window in the next conversation, as Samara has decided that she wants to go after the criminal that she's been after immediately. She tells you that this fugitive is named Morinth, and that she's what the ancient Asari called an Ardat Yakshi. I previously explained the Asari mating process a bit in my Mass Effect 1 video, but basically when an Asari chooses a mate, they temporarily merge nervous systems with their partner while they copy their partner's genetic code and combine it with their own. Well, the Ardat Yakshi have a rare genetic disorder which causes this process to be fatal for their partners. Basically, they wind up overloading their partner's nervous system and cause their brain to hemorrhage. Samara explains that there are three known Ardat Yakshi, and that two of them have chosen a life of seclusion. Obviously, the third one is our fugitive, as she's been fucking her way across the galaxy at an incredible pace. But the biggest monkey wrench in all of this is the reason why the matter is so personal to Samara. Morinth, along with the other two Ardat Yakshi, are her daughters. After her third child proved to be addicted to the ecstasy of fucking and killing her mates, she fled. This tore Samara apart, and she did what she felt she had to do, giving up all of her possessions to become a Justicar and live life by her code. It's a great background in my eyes that gives Samara the perfect reason to be the way that she is beyond just wanting to be holy or religious. So we head off to Omega after figuring out that Morinth is hanging out there and banging people to death. When we arrive, we head to the scene of a woman whose daughter was recently seduced and murdered. We gather evidence before laying down a plan to trap her, which involves Shepard acting as bait to lure Morinth out at the club. The lead up to getting into her apartment is, um... It's a, it's a mixed bag. So you start off trying to attract Morinth's attention so that she'll move in on you. Insulting Krogans, fighting Turians, getting this girl away from a gang leader. This is the good part. And it's fun to basically mingle in a club and try to come off as the badass that Shepard can be. The bad part is actually talking to Morinth. The whole conversation works like a checklist. Talk about art? Check. Talk about music? Check. Talk about traveling? Check. And every time you have to talk about power or violence or some other edgy shit. Now I can understand that Shep has to say shit like this to attract this obviously psychotic woman. I'm okay with that. But the conversation is so jarring in how it basically loads each response and question. Like it doesn't feel like a natural conversation at all. What do you think of Halleck? It slithers through my soul. Seems like we share some interests. I've traveled all over the galaxy. Violence is a means to an end. Power is that end. But violence is such a charming way to reach that end. Do you know anything about art? It's just one of those things where the game wants you to pick the right conversation topics. But really, it shouldn't give you all of these choices. If two people are having a back and forth, the other should offer up a topic as well every here and there. I don't know, it just felt fucking weird. If I saw an image of you, that would move me. 
Oh, that's, um, sweet of you to say. Art comes in many varieties. At any rate, when you make it back to Morinth's pad, you can choose to resist her charms. If you do, Samara comes bursting in and begins having a DBZ fight with her daughter. Partway through it, Morinth suggests that you turn on Samara, which you can actually do. Much like Dragon Age, you can replace your good guy with a bad guy. I know that good and bad here are relative, but let me just make my sweeping generalizations. The point is that you can kill Samara here instead if you like, and Morinth joins you as a loyal crew member, putting on her dead mother's clothes and imitating her accent. It's kind of fucked up, but I actually really like this possibility a lot. The interesting bit here if you do keep her around is that you can choose to fuck her after the final mission. And if you do, Shepard dies, which is a nice touch. But either way, we're not going down that route. As much as I enjoy this idea, it's again a lot like Alistair and Loghain. It's a neat addition for another playthrough where Shep is more ruthless. But we've known Samara for longer and I'd rather see her through to the end. Though on that note, and I will touch on this later, but when you think about the sheer amount of lines and interactions that you have with Alistair, choosing him over Loghain for the majority of your playthroughs is a no-brainer. I've hardly spoken to Samara by comparison. Hmm. At any rate, Morinth winds up dead on the ground after Samara finally ends her daughter's life with a well-placed punch. When you return back to the ship and talk with Samara, she explains that she's proud of her daughter for being so smart and brave, despite being the monster that she was. It's a complicated set of feelings that only she can really understand fully. She gets that being an Ardot Yakshi is a chain that binds someone to a path in life, and that her third daughter chose to fight it, to be free. She also ruminates on the thought that this may be the reason for the stigma surrounding the idea that the Asari shouldn't breed with their own kind, as it's only the purebloods which wind up with this condition. It's an interesting expansion on this idea that was presented in the first game, and I like the concepts here a lot. Though you would think that having two kids back to back that are Ardot Yakshi would kind of like repel you from having a third child. I don't know, I mean like, I know shit happens, and I'm not saying that she shouldn't have a third kid, but I mean, it's one of those things where you're like, oh no, now my daughter has to be chained to this secluded place. And then like the third one turned out that way, I, I don't know. I don't know, it's kind of an interesting point that Shepard never really brings up. Either way, Samara claims that she's at peace finally with the decisions that she's made, even if they will eventually lead to her death. She intends to continue her one-woman crusade against any Ardot Yakshi which may exist across the galaxy after all is said and done. Samara is a scary individual, but a badass one. She has no qualms about killing those who she deigns to be corrupt in any way, and I could easily see her being regarded as a devil by some people. Listening to her tell her story about killing off every single member of a village besides the children because they had been corrupted by Morinth, and then dropping the children off with the authorities before just leaving, really shows who and how she is. She's an interesting character, one that sticks out to me as wholly different from the others that we've assembled here, and I do appreciate her as part of the crew. I might seem a hero to many, but I would kill all of them if I had to. Overall, every single character adds something to this game. Hell, I would say every single character is this game. I mean, the amount of time that we talked about them really shows just how much they take up in terms of overall game time. It's kind of weird to say, but the optional loyalty quests probably take up around 20 to 25% of the game. The recruitment quests probably take up another 25% by themselves, at least. It's possible that the main missions in this game take a good 20% of it. But of course, this is all an estimation. And I think I only really had a problem with Kasumi and Miranda. And even then, I realized that they did have a place in this game by the time I wrapped them up. That's kind of an insane amount of hit to miss ratio when it comes to designing characters that the player cares about. It's really not something that you see every day. And it's what makes Mass Effect 2 so special. But all of that said, there is a small issue that I actually kind of discovered in a roundabout way after talking about Samara. When I think about, say, Miranda or Jacob or even someone like Garrus and compare how well I know them and how much I've interacted with them to, say, Alistair, Morrigan, shit, probably most of the Dragon Age Origins party. I mean, it's just a night and day difference. And I'm guessing it's why Mass Effect 3 saw us going back down to a 7-member party rather than a 12-member one. Mass Effect 2's crew conversations generally tend to be in small bursts of information. 
maybe two to four minutes worth at a time. Dragon Age? Eh, you could probably be talking to someone for literally 10 to 15 minutes at a time depending on which stage you're at in their dialogue. Now, I do know that it's also about twice or more as long as Mass Effect 2 is, and the focus seemed to be more quality-driven than quantity like Mass Effect. But even so, it's not like I'm sitting here and trying to paint Mass Effect's character as bad by comparison. Hell, I just said that they make the game what it is. I think it comes down to a preference thing. Some people would rather their party speak in these small bursts so that they can get back to playing. If they want more, they can choose to investigate more and press for details. But they don't need to wade through hours of dialogue to get someone's loyalty mission. I think I just prefer Dragon Age's system of really getting to understand people. And it's probably why Morden is one of my favorite characters. Because he's just so much more fleshed out by comparison to many of the others. This is notable particularly with Morden's post-loyalty mission dialogue, as he continues to talk to you about stuff that's on his mind, giving you insight into his species, his connections, his personality. And while that does happen to a lesser degree with a lot of the other crew, the amount that he has to say really makes him stand out more than a lot of the others. The only other thing that I can really complain about here is that the loyalty missions themselves are a bit more hit and miss than the characters. I would say that it's a 50-50 mix between the missions falling in the good to great range and the bad to okay at best range. A lot of the time they felt more shoehorned in how they approach things, or even wound up reflecting poorly on the character, making me care less about them overall. You can tell which of these missions were written with the crew member's personality in mind, and which of them tried to force emotion the player probably doesn't feel into the characters. It's a bit annoying, and while I wouldn't go so far as to say that they ruin parts of the game, I would say that the more sloppily executed ones at least leave a stain on their corresponding character writing. But at any rate, there is a lot more dialogue to cover when you look at all of the members which we have here. But I think I did a pretty okay job at conveying how I felt about their personalities without going into overtime. There is one more member that we haven't gotten to yet, but we'll grab them in a bit and talk about them right away. So partway through our loyalty mission escapades, we get word from the elusive man about a collector ship having been crippled by a Turian scouting ship. The thing's still intact, but it's lying dormant for now. So it's on us to get in there for some intel and get out before the Turians send reinforcements. When we make it to this massive ghost ship, it becomes evident that the collectors have been experimenting on humans, while also cutting up some of their own people to compare the differences in structure. Then it's revealed that the Collectors are actually Protheans, which were the species who went extinct trying to stop the Reapers in the first game. Well, they were Protheans. The Reapers had done significant genetic experiments on the Protheans to turn them into Collectors. It makes everything about the way that the Collectors are able to show up out of seemingly nowhere make complete sense, as the Reapers were basically able to do the same thing. But more importantly, Morden later states that the Reapers replaced most of the Protheans' minds and bodies with technology, meaning that they can't be freed from this indoctrination, and that they're now closer to mindless husks rather than slaves. This means that the Collectors weren't cutting open themselves to compare their bodies to humans, the Reapers were controlling them to figure it out for themselves. After this, you actually get to choose another weapon specialization. In my case, I get to choose between assault or sniper rifles. This is a cool thing to gain mechanically, but it's also kind of weird. Like Shepard just comes across a pile of guns and he goes, oh yeah, an assault rifle. I forgot about these. It just seems like something he'd have to learn or relearn at a specific location, not in the midst of a collector vessel. This ship is fucking creepy though. It's all kind of like a mix of organic and inorganic materials. A lot of its imagery reminds me of the Zerg in a way just with how fleshy and gooey and organic everything is. It's fucking gross, but it's also cool. I just like how our ship's AI is like, I ran a scan on the pods. They're filled with humans, but the humans are all dead. I know this is a future space-time fantasy game, but the little Normandy ship AI running a scan on the inside of this massive collector ship and being able to detect life forms that are now dead is a little out there for me. I don't know why that one was the straw that broke the camel's dick for me, but for some reason it was. All right, running, running, grabbing some shit, running. That's big. Running, running, and finally we make it to the end. 
Yeah, it turns out that literally no enemies the entire way probably means that you should download that illicit torrent file directly to your ship, but hey, we don't think, we shoot. And when we don't have anything to shoot, our brain shuts down. But what makes even less sense here is what happens after we fight through these collector assholes who get the drop on us. So the ship's AI tells us to reconnect to the Normandy so that it can finish extracting the data from the collector ship. Now, if this whole thing was meant to be a trap to get Shepard here and eliminate him, why wouldn't they fill the console with dummy data that didn't make any sense? I mean, it's not like us being lured here involved any kind of caution on our end. I mean, it could have had a video of someone's Paper Mario Let's Play or something. I mean, I know I'll wind up talking about this later, but there's a reason why they have all of the human bodies here on the ship, so I could understand not wanting to plant a bomb or something like that. But yeah, the actual data on this console doesn't make a whole lot of sense if this is supposed to be a trap. But when we reconnect our ship, the AI finds out the info which would allow for us to navigate the previously untraversable relays which lead to wherever the collectors are hiding out. I don't know, it's more than a little stupid. Because even if this data was another trap, you would think that the Normandy crew would be extra cautious after completely failing their perception check on this first trap. Either way, the last key detail here is that our ship's AI breaks the news that there's no possible way that the elusive man didn't realize that this was a trap based off of the data that we found here. Of course, the elusive man does his whole, well, you would have tipped off the collectors if you knew. This was the only way, kind of thing when we make it back after escaping the ship. It is predictable, but Shepard does his whole barking like a chained dog routine before we meet up with the team to discuss the data that we picked up. This data leads to one of my favorite concepts in this game, that the Collector homeworld is basically right on the cusp of the supermassive black hole which resides at the center of the galaxy. Basically, they use an advanced system which identifies their ships as friendly, and then their specified relays launch them precisely to a safe pocket of space surrounded by all of the crazy explosive bullshit at the center of the galaxy. Now, I will say that a center of a galaxy is generally chaotic, Black holes, dead, dying, and exploding stars, all of that shit. You would think that this would cause some unpredictability with what could happen. And what could be a safe zone at one point might suddenly not be one in no time. Though then again, if the Reapers were savvy enough to accomplish this feat in the first place, I would imagine they would have a way to adjust to any unpredictability. All right, so we're nearing the end of this ride, but we still have some side stuff to wrap up. I mean, there's an absolute load of side stuff, but I'm gonna try to make this painless and hit the more important ones. So I might miss a thing or two, but we'll be all right. First up, let's actually hit the Citadel, which is such a weird thing to say this far in. I mean, shit, it was the main hub in the first game, but it's definitely got a bit of an expansion in terms of where we can go and how things look. There are stores absolutely everywhere. I'm Commander Shepard and this is my favorite store on the Citadel. There are lots of little mini quests to pick up. I've had enough of your disingenuous assertions. <laughs> I wish I'd done that the first time we met. But most importantly, we can meet back up with the Council after returning from the dead. These guys are still tremendous dickheads as it turns out. For as much gratitude as they showed at the end of the first game, and as much as they told you that they were sorry for doubting you for the entire game, they now completely deny the claims of the Reaper threat. It's one thing to do that in the public eye, to try and calm people down after the biggest attack on the Citadel that ever happened. But it's a whole other thing to actually look at Shepard and make the same mistake twice. Oh, the Reapers? Yeah, it's bullshit. It's done, there's no need to believe you after what happened last time. God, that's aggravating. Now I get that you could go, well, Shepard is working for Cerberus now, which is an enemy of the Citadel. And that's fair. I would err on the side of caution too. But would I just fucking deny claims from the reason that the galaxy was saved the first time? Come on. It's, uh... If this was more integral to the plot, I would call it lazy writing. But there are people out there who exist with this personality type. The ones who will constantly give you shit for something that they don't want to believe and then thank you for helping them, only to go back to not believing you again. I guess it just bothers me that all three of the other council members are in agreement with this particular judgment call, instead of just the asshole Turian like the last game. 
Anderson doesn't blame the council, of course, claiming that it's probably something they would rather deny than talk about. It makes sense, but it's an annoying phenomenon to deal with. Though again, it really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. At any rate, I get reinstated as a Spectre, which Anderson assures us is merely a title rather than a resource at this stage. I guess we'll take it. There's another little thing that I wanted to touch on, but I wasn't quite sure where to put it. It has to do with Samara, but I didn't feel like it fit in with her synopsis. So at the end of the line with her, you have the option to romance her. Kind of. Look, I'm all for the idea that two adults who are really close to each other might have a little cat and mouse back and forth kind of thing. Like maybe one or the other plays a little hard to get, and eventually they give in. Sure. But this setup is really fucking strange to me, because it's not that at all. Basically, Shepard goes, hey, Samara, let's date. And she's like, um, so you're like 30 to 40-ish, and I'm like 900-ish? I do feel like we have a connection, but I'm gonna have to politely decline. And Shepard's like, all right, all right, all right, but do you want to bang? And she's like, uh, no, but thank you. And you literally get two more options to continue to pressure Samara into casual sex. Samara, it can be. You just have to open your mind. I serve a code stronger and deeper than any feelings. You've kept tight control for a long time. But you still have needs, Samara. I have the strength to withstand my own drives, Shepard. You don't have to. The galaxy won't end if you find a little happiness. You're different from anyone I've met. I think I could find more than happiness with you. But my self-control is who I am. Don't pursue this, please. You've been strong through so much. Now it's your time. It's really uncomfortable and I don't even want to press for it. Like, I guess I get the idea that Bioware was going for here, and that there would be something between them if Samara was younger and not a crusading holy paladin. And this is supposed to be one of those moments of reality when you don't always get what you want in a video game. But like, it's, uh, it's very... Dude, you have to go through four different dialogue trees and every time she goes, no, thank you, Shepard, until she literally walks away and to another part of the ship. She then will only say the word, please, as she stares out the window. Like, is this a lesson to someone? Is it self-aware? I don't know. But it does extend to a lesser extent to pretty much every relationship. What idiotic bunch of hormones thought that now was a great time for love? Who said anything about love? I'm just trying to get you into bed. Leave me alone, Shepard. I don't want this. You're lying. Don't tell me what I feel. I've been here before and I know what I need. For me. I cannot imagine what this is like for you. They're wrong. You wouldn't just die like this. You wouldn't leave me. Hey. Hey, come here. Bro, she just found her fucking dead dad on the ground. It feels like a power fantasy the way a lot of this stuff is written. And again, as an isolated incident, this really doesn't have any red flags. It's one of those things where you kind of look at it like, oh, maybe it's a little weird, but hey, you know, maybe they're just closer than you thought. But when you kind of add it to everything else before this, it's one of those things where now it's kind of a little weird. It's just a really cocky kind of Will Shatner's Captain Kirk outdated way of approaching women as the commander of the ship. And it doesn't really sit right with me at all. At any rate, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the Firewalker DLC, which is a pretty decent addition to the game from a sheer gameplay perspective. I mentioned that there were no Mako missions in this game, which there aren't. What there are instead are Hammerhead missions which has you piloting this very arcadey but fun to control hovercraft type of thing. It can launch itself in the air, hover slowly down, shoot missiles, and generally controls much better than the Mako ever did. You might have also noticed that I'm calling it the Mako in this game instead of the Mako. And that's because enough of your comments called me out as being a big idiot for mispronouncing a word, which I vehemently disagree with. I'm a big idiot because I critique video games on the internet for a living, not because I pronounced a word wrong. Anyways, these missions aren't super in-depth artistic story pieces, they're just dumb fun, which is exactly what I would want them to be. 
I don't need them to have these over-the-top narratives, I just want to shoot dudes and absorb knowledge. I will say that the absorption process is fucking stupid in the Legendary Edition for one reason, though. This. I don't know who made the executive decision to make the fucking vehicle create a noise akin to my Super NES cartridge getting jostled loose by accident in the remake, but I have a feeling it was a developer who was mad about people who cried about Miranda's dedicated ass cam being cut from the game. I did enjoy the missions at first, but then they soured almost instantly for me, as the amount of options that you have compared to the Mako defensively are… bad. So with the Mako, you did have a repair, which had a cooldown. It was good for getting out of tight spots. You also had natural cover a lot of the time. And you had a long-range zoom for sniping dudes. With Firewalker, the Hammerhead has no repair and little cover. Most of the time, you're just shooting dudes on a flat plane with one weapon that has auto-aim and no zoom. This makes the battles go one of two ways. Either you steamroll them, or you take two shots from a Geth Heavy and die. Your only option defensively is turning around and running until your shields recover. It makes the combat ridiculously stale, and it completely killed the DLC for me. I don't know how you ruin this setup by not making combat more interesting, but it is worth noting that I believe only two of five missions have combat. I don't know, it's a mixed bag for me, but I'm glad that I didn't pay for this DLC. The next DLC is Arrival, which is something that I actually did after the final mission, but I'm gonna talk about it now to keep everything relatively tidy. So you remember that one time hours ago when I mentioned Hackett and never elaborated? Yeah, that one's the Arrival DLC. Undercover agent, going alone, that shit. This has to be the strangest mission in this game. So basically, it's a stealth mission, but there's no stealth mechanics in this game. No crouching, stealthing, or CQC beyond your melee attack. But the whole thing is built like your standard stealth op style of game. You cut the power on lasers and doors, redirect flames from open fire valves, move cargo containers to bypass them, walk around guards which are watching a particular direction. It's really off-putting because this isn't good design just because these elements exist. There's no fucking reason for half of this shit to have literal laser detection systems. And even if they do, the panels to access them are out in the open on your side of the level. So it's really more of a big-ass walking simulator. Of course, you can also go in loud and treat it like any other level, but even then, you're still going to be doing half of the stealth shit anyways, so why bother? It's just really weird. The intrigue here stems from overhearing guards talk about the doctor who you were trying to rescue, or listening to logs which have been left out. Basically, Dr. Kenton was caught trying to destroy the mass relay system by redirecting an asteroid into it. And the Batarians here caught her and are trying to figure out why the fuck she would do that. So we rescue her and we're back in business in terms of clicking on dudes as they pop out of doors and elevators. We escape and get to question the doctor who explains that, yeah, they were trying to destroy the mass relay here. Her reasoning was the discovery of evidence that the Reapers would be arriving in the system soon, and with the power of this relay, they could be anywhere in the galaxy within minutes. Destroying this relay would set them back years and give the rest of civilization time to prepare a solution. All right, sure, so far so good, right? Well, by her estimation, destroying the relay would more or less cause a supernova which would wipe out the entire system, including 300,000 Batarians. Now, fortunately, no one gives a shit about Batarians besides Batarians. Hell, even the devs don't give a shit about Batarians, only using them as veritable boogeymen who commit heinous acts towards other races. There's not a single Batarian that I can think of who was a cool guy who just wanted to get along. Of course, I could be wrong there, but I can confidently say that the number of Batarians who have just been asshole mercs or have actively tried to kill or sabotage peoples from other civilizations far outweighs the number of good ones. So we make it to the base which Kenson was working out of. She explains that the Reaper artifact which they found pulses more frequently as the Reapers get closer to it. Using this, they've discovered that there's about two whole days until the Reapers arrive. I wonder what happens if you leave your game on until this clock runs out. Yeah. 
Holy shit, that's a cool ass easter egg. So what happens here is that there's a fucking reaper artifact sitting out in the open. If you know anything about reapers, you'd know that they're constantly trying to indoctrinate people. That even a dead one will do this. Shepard mentions this. Kenton goes, Oh, nah, bro, we've taken countermeasures. And Shep's like, Well, okay. Surprise, Kenton and everyone else here has been mind-controlled. Though they definitely didn't start out that way since this place is designed to destroy that relay. Hordes of men start pouring through the doors pretty non-stop. If you go down, it isn't game over, as you get captured by the Reaper-controlled Kenson who claims that they want Shepard alive. If you survive, you get an achievement. But you still get knocked out when the artifact pulses. You actually don't get an achievement in the Legendary Edition, so whatever. Shepard soon wakes up on a medical table after being patched up and sedated. The problem is that the doctors didn't account for the raw fucking girth that is Shepard, and didn't give him elephant tranquilizer. So he springs up and punches the guards out before getting locked in the room. This introduces another mechanic where you can take over control of a mech and help yourself out of the room and into the rest of the base. Shep suits up and starts blasting his way out and the whole thing is like a fucking action movie. Shepard's tearing us apart. He's in the dining room. Oh, there goes Dave. Oh, he's on a warpath. Oh, why did we ever seal him near an area where he has access to weapons and armor? But yeah, it's cool in its own way, as you probably feel closer to a one-man army superhero than you ever have in this game since you don't have a team backing you up. The whole thing is very cheesy, though. Definitely plays out more like a Hollywood movie than ever as Shepard activates the project and instead of Kenson just silently doing what she's trying to do, she comes onto the screen to go, No, Shep! I gotta go melt down the reactor now to destroy the asteroid! Oh, damn it, Shep! Don't try to stop me by going down the hall and taking a right to get to the reactor. No! So yeah, she runs to the reactor, continues to yell at Shep to not try to stop her, and then begins inserting firewood into the reactor. We have to run around this area filled with guards and insert a couple of vats of ice-cold Coca-Cola into some devices to cool the shiny orb down. After we do this, we go to confront Kenton directly, who has created or pulled out, uh, like, um, she just has a remote explosive, and when you shoot her, she just presses it anyways. And then Shepard gets knocked out for like a day and a half or something. Because when he gets up, there's like 30 minutes left on the timer. Alright, so this whole DLC is stupid from a logistics viewpoint. First off, Kenson gets taken prisoner at the beginning, right? And the rest of the station is just like, Well, guess we can't launch the asteroid into the relay. I mean, you could argue that they were all indoctrinated by then. But if that were the case, wouldn't the Reapers have the crew disassemble the asteroid? or blow it up or whatever. So either they're waiting around and going, oh, we can't fucking launch this thing without her, or they're indoctrinated and the Reapers were like, well, hang on, let's, uh, let's wait to see if someone can come fuck this up for us. You could argue that Kenton was the only one that knew how to start the asteroid onto its path, but Shepard ran in here and just activated it. And he's not even a member of the science team. Secondly, the Reapers have literally been thwarted twice by this one fucking human being in his squad. And they go, wait, 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 let's bring Shepard back to the one place that he can stop us. I mean, sure, maybe the indoctrination wore off for a moment when she was captured. But then they capture Shepard and throw him in a glass box with a way to escape and a weapon cache right next to him. I mean, how badly do you want to indoctrinate Shepard that you'd risk him setting back your plans for a third time? Just throw him into space, man. This is the first time that you've tried to capture him. Not even the collectors who got the jump on him at the start of the game collected him. Anyways, yeah, DLC's dumb. But it does actually affect Mass Effect 3. I mean, not a huge amount, but I feel like it gives it a little more flavor. I just wish it wasn't so logistically flawed, but cinematically speaking, it was a fun DLC to watch unfold. I mean, if you turn your brain off like you're watching Marvel's The Superhero Movie. There's one more DLC that I'd like to cover for now, I think. Returning to the crash site of the Normandy. It's, uh, it's okay. At best. You basically just beam down to the wreckage and look around for dog tags. 
You can erect a solid gold statue that Shepard pulls out of his asshole, experience stunning still image screenshots of the old Normandy which looks exactly like parts of the new Normandy, and break crates. This was a nice idea, I guess, but without any sort of flashback dialogue, it's just this. Maybe I'm not sentimental enough for it, but I also think that this really just hammers home how little I knew or cared about the old Normandy crew. I mean, sure, they put in a data pad from Presley, which was nice enough, but I don't care about Presley. They had 20 dog tags and I didn't know a single person that they belonged to. They even put a still of Ashley in there for some reason. I'm guessing because they realized that they had no one else that the player would recognize. But whatever. At least it was free DLC and I didn't have to take the Dr. Pepper challenge to get it like some of the armor in the game. There is more DLC beyond this, seven in total actually. Kasumi and Zaid's loyalty missions were two of them. Then you had the Firewalker, Arrival, and Normandy stuff. And finally, you have Project Overlord and Layer of the Shadow Broker. But I'm actually not going to be covering those two. It's not that they're bad. Actually, I have no idea if they are. I've never played them. I just want to get this video out before New Year's and I know that they're pretty sizable DLC since one has you chunking through five whole areas to stop a rogue VI and the other has you helping Liara to take down the Shadow Broker. Again, apologies here, but I gotta set a limit when I'm working against time. I mean, shit, it was almost Christmas when I typed this. So let's finally refocus on the main stuff here. Like I mentioned before, the Collectors and by extension the Reapers use a certain system to traverse the relays which they built to launch themselves to their base at the center of the galaxy. Fortunately for us, we can salvage the bits that make this system work from a recently discovered dead Reaper which is floating around a brown dwarf. That's our mission now. Head to the big thing, take the little thing, slap it on the ship like a pirate flag to secure passage to danger. Of course, doing all of that is a lot easier said than done. The reason why the Reaper hasn't been pulled in by the brown dwarf's gravity is due to it having some kind of backup system to put up a Mass Effect field to protect its husk. Well, when we make it to the thing, it reacts by putting up a kinetic barrier on top of that, meaning that the Normandy can't get us out until we shut it down. Shutting it down would cause the Mass Effect field to drop, meaning that gravity would affect the Reaper again. You see where we might be going with this. The recorded logs around here showcase the Reaper's mind-affecting technology at play, as the Cerberus scientists which made it here before us start to have their memories overwritten with each others, and generally start doing goofy shit like whispering to test tubes. I know this has been happening for like the whole game, but there's something to be said about this kind of storytelling. I mean, we land on this derelict Reaper, and there are just these random logs all over the place showcasing specifically people losing their shit. And there isn't like some mastermind sitting behind it all and going, take a look at these logs, Shepard, this is your fate. It's just how Bioware tells its story sometimes. It's functional, but it doesn't really make all that much sense when you think about it. Anyways, as mentioned before, the Reaper still exerts this force on the minds of the living, even if it's dead. The actual gameplay of this has us taking on husks nonstop. At one point, a sniper is revealed to us as it takes two shots at some husks. Later down the line, it reveals itself to be a Geth who clears out more husks around Shepard, and then it addresses Shepard before leaving. So this is Legion. The only reason that Legion was introduced this way was so that Shepard didn't have a reason to immediately start blasting it on sight, I imagine. Still, it's a cool scene. But we have to continue to play Zombies Are Cool Still in 2010 to get to the Geth before we can interact with it any further. After obtaining the part that we came here for, we eventually do get to Legion, who's plugging away at a computer in front of the Reaper core. Well, it gets its GPU knocked loose since apparently husks just attack any sort of sentient being, I guess. Maybe it's because it was specifically fucking with the Reaper's core. This leads into a sort of boss fight where we fight waves of zombies, shoot the core, and repeat that two more times. It's, uh, it's a boss fight. It exists. I have no strong feelings about it. Well, after destroying the core, it's time to get the hell out, to which Thane suggests that we bring the unconscious Geth with us. Tally doesn't like the idea, but Shep makes the executive decision as they escape back onto the Normandy. When we make it back safe and sound, we can choose to sell off the Geth to Cerberus or reactivate it. Actually, we can also just keep it inactive like we can with Grunt. 
but obviously I reactivate it. If you hadn't guessed yet, this would be our final companion here, and we might as well talk about it now. So Legion whirs back to life and answers Shepard's question in a confusing manner as you would expect from a robot-type entity. When it addresses itself, it uses the term we, as you might expect of something named Legion. It then claims that it's been watching humans on the extranet, including Shepard, which explains how it knows of him. Legion's motivation is shared with his brethren, a splinter group of Geth which originally rebelled against the Quarians. The way that Legion explains it, not every Geth wants to follow the Reapers around. Some of them want to build their own future. Others wanted their future planned for them by the Reapers. The ones who follow the Reapers are regarded as heretics by Legion here. Are you asking to join us? Yes. Then what should I call you? Geth. I mean you, specifically. We are all Geth. What is the individual in front of me called? There is no individual. We are Geth. Yeah, Edie is the one who names Legion what it is, basically. Oh yeah, the ship's AI is called Edie. I don't know why I've put off calling her that this whole time. Anyway, so Legion is a collection of 1,183 Geth programs in a single shell. I explained this a bit in the previous game's video, but Geth get smarter as more of them pool together. The average Geth unit which we've been facing up until this point houses around 100 programs. Tally describes these typical Geth to be as dumb as wild animals. So a Legion has about 12 times that amount of intelligence. It also has some crazy answers about the Reapers specifically. So basically, Reapers are also Geth-like in their composition. They're also a collection of programs, running and working together. The difference is that the Geth depend on each other to grow smarter and run better, while the Reapers programs work completely fine on their own if separated. It's actually kind of funny listening to Shep question Legion. He asks about stuff like Geth government structures, their relationship to the Reapers, why they can talk, etc. And Legion just kind of patiently answers him. It explains shit like government to them being more of a mutual consensus. And Shepard's like, Wow, that must take a long time. This was right after they explained that they only talk because that's the only way to speak with humans. Otherwise, they just communicate with each other at light speed. Either way, Legion's loyalty mission involves it figuring out that Sovereign developed a virus to indoctrinate all of the Geth, which heretics are planning to use to do just that. This would cause Legion to also turn against organics everywhere, which seems… not good. So we gotta get to that virus and destroy it, or to rewrite it and turn all of the heretics into normal Geth which would then join Legion. This has us running through this fucking Halo level of Geth after Geth, as you might expect. Legion is having a hard time coming to a decision on whether or not it wants to rewrite its counterparts throughout this whole thing and it debates this the entire way to the core of the base. At one stage, it discovers that the heretics' routines and thinking have been drastically changed from what they originally had been. This surprises Legion, as it willingly let the heretics go to do what they wanted to do. It explains that there exists an inherent acceptance of each other between the two factions, just because they were all built the same way and share the same kind of thought processes. But this new thinking involves spying on Legion, which Legion finds to be super off-putting, seeing as it would have just given the heretics the information that they wanted if they asked. None of that matters now as we have the opportunity to decide for Legion what the right call is here. Obviously, the rewrite is the more interesting choice, so I went for that. And now suddenly, the Geth don't care about killing organics anymore. When we get back to the ship, it turns out that Legion has realized that the Quarians might be moving in to attack the Geth. So it planned on scanning Tally's Omni tool in order to send data about the flotilla to the rest of the Geth. Tally is obviously pissed, but you have to understand that if you view the Geth as human, and the Quarians were planning to attack a group of humans, then those humans would be in the right to warn their people. Shepard says this and then scolds Legion for trying to start a war between the two factions, which is probably the best way to resolve this little argument. Either way, that's it for Legion. Not a terribly complex character from a personality viewpoint since it's a robot, but an extraordinarily interesting one just by what it is. I like Legion, but I just wouldn't rank it terribly high on the list here yet. And by yet, I mean that Legion shows up in the next game and develops in a pretty damn cool way. But we'll get to that. One day.
in the distant future. So after Legion's loyalty escapades, the game actually forces you into another mission, in which Joker and Edie let you know that the Reaper device that we picked up to help us through the special Omega-4 relay is just about done being integrated with the ship. Except there's a bit of a hitch, and Edie advises us to take the Normandy's shuttle down to our nameless next mission. After Shepard and the rest of the primary crew vacate, Edie realizes that the Reaper device that we installed was a trap. Not only are the main systems of the ship overtaken by a virus, but the thing is transmitting the Normandy's location to the collectors. Boy, these collector guys are really good at setting a trap. Either way, this next bit is really fucking cool. So this whole game you're playing as badass Commander Shepard of the Normandy. Biotic superstar, soldier extraordinaire. Together with his sidekicks, he saves the day and all that shit. Basically, collectors ain't shit, no matter how terrifying they tend to look. Well, now I'm playing as Seth Green's Joker, who has a bum leg and all the combat skill of a toddler on Adderall. Joker's mission is to hobble to the AI core and give her permissions that he didn't want to give her before so that she can try to fight off the collectors with the defense systems. Now, like I said, collectors are just another monster to fry for Shep. To Joker, on the other hand, he gets front row seats to watching these tremendous creatures burst through the doors and skewer and drag people away. It's fucking brutal, because it lends a perspective to this franchise that you don't really see beyond the occasional recording. This is what normal people go through when the collectors want them dead. And the whole thing gives them more substance than anything else so far. Anyways, back to Joker. Great, so this is where it starts. When we're just all organic batteries, guess who they'll blame? Well, this is all Joker's fault. What a tool he was. I have to spend all day computing Pi because he plugged in the Overlord. Now you must reactivate the primary drive in engineering. Ah, uh, you want me to go crawling through the ducts again? I enjoy the sight of humans on their knees. That is a joke. Right. So Joker eventually sneaks by the rest of the collectors, who have now gone about keeping to their namesake and collecting as much of the crew as possible. When Joker overrides the second set of controls, Edie opens the airlocks and speeds off like a bullet, effectively killing off the remaining collectors which hadn't left with the crew already. Now this is actually much more of an emotionally impactful scene, since the game has made it much more of an objective to get to know these people. Kelly, the inappropriate psychologist, Scottish Ken, Chef Rupert and the mess hall crew, gossiping Andy, the family man, Scottish Ken's sidekick Gabby, Dr. Chakwas. You interact with most of these characters at some point if you're just picking up side quests, so losing them here feels a lot worse than the OG Normandy crew. So here comes dumbass Miranda, who's trying her best to sink to the bottom of the power rankings, as she flies in here at Mach 10 and scolds Joker for letting the crew get captured, and giving Edie control of the ship. Are you just angry or stupid or a mix of both? Because Jesus Christ, also kind of weird how Edie is a construct commissioned and put into place directly by the elusive man, and Miranda doesn't trust it. But whatever. It's time to do the final mission of the vanilla game, and push into wrapping this fucking video up. You got it, Commander. Plotting a course for the Omega-4 relay. ETA about two hours. ETA about two hours. Two hours. So, I've taken some antibiotics as well as some herbal supplements that should bolster my immune system. I was going to bring music. So heading through the relay is a cool ass scene as you might expect. When you arrive and see the super massive black hole in the distance, you're immediately jumped by little laser boys. After some quick maneuvering, we wind up taking damage and getting boarded. Shepard goes down to deal with the breach without a helmet, which makes no sense, but hey, whatever. When all is said and done, the dumbass collector ship which has been hounding us for the whole game makes an appearance, only for Joker to pull out a fucking laser beam. We've had this the whole fucking game? What if the rest of the crew was on that ship? I mean, yeah, it's a badass scene, but um... I guess we're just banking on them not being on those little pods on the ship. Okay, so there's some very intricate decision making here at the end of the game. First off, it's worth noting that completing more missions after your crew gets kidnapped will cause those crew members to die slowly. So it's imperative that you do the mission ASAP after their abduction. 
I think you can get away with one whole mission before they start dying off. Secondly, throughout the game you get these upgrades for your ship if you choose to speak to certain characters about them. Shielding, armor, and that cannon that you saw in the cutscene prior. I've had that cannon since I recruited Garrus, just FYI. So we definitely could have used it against them by now. Anyways, if you're missing these upgrades, the cutscenes actually change a bit and one member of your crew will die for each missing one. This is fucking awesome, and it's a really cool way to experience real consequences for your lack of upgrades or urgency. Next, we have to send in someone to infiltrate the air ducts, a tech specialist. This means Tally, Kasumi, or Legion. I went with Tally. If the person sent up into the ducts isn't loyal to you, they'll die. Next up, we have to send in an alternate fire squad with a leader to head the charge. This would be Garrus, Miranda, or Jacob. I went with Garrus. Again, death if they're not loyal. Now we head in with whoever, and there'll be more choices in a moment. This mission is probably one of, if not the best things in this game. The music is stellar, the lead up is perfect, and the choices here and how they affect the outcome are Bioware in top form in my opinion. I'm actually not even going to summarize a lot of this just because, well, I think it's fucking great. Emotionally impactful, fun to watch, and overall just really exciting. I know this is a weird break, but when I summarize things, the summary tends to be to give people context for what I'm about to say. Am I long-winded? Yeah, I mean, yeah. But I do it when I usually have something more to say than just, this is really fun. I mean, it's not always the case, but usually there's some critique attached to my summaries. I have nothing to say here for a lot of this part. And I think that's fine because it really should be experienced for oneself in my eyes. Anyways, when we get to where the crew that was collected is taken, we watch as one of the colonists from, um, fuck, the uh, planet with Caden, Caden planet, shit, uh, Horizon, Horizon. Yeah, the Horizon colonist fucking melts, like melts. That shit is fucking scary. When we save our crew before they also get turned into sludge, Chakwas explains that the Reapers are using this human goo to fuel… something. But for now, our next choice here is to choose a biotic specialist in the flavor of Jack or Samara, to shield a small team to open up the security doors ahead. And then I also have to pick a second diversion team with the same options as before. I go with Jack and Garrus for these decisions. The last decision that we have for now is to send someone back to escort the rest of the crew to safety. You can decline to escort them if you want your Normandy crew to die off for some reason, but anyone who's loyal works here. I went with my squishy fella Morden. Gameplay-wise, everything is thrown at you from the collector's side of things. Husks, collector soldiers, and the ever-present Harbinger who assumes direct control almost constantly instead of once per battle. It actually takes the serviceable combat system and does its best with it, creating a pretty engaging fight to the center of this place. Jack holds the barrier around you like a badass, constantly keeping these little bugs off of you while you cover her. It's a really fucking cool scene, and likewise, I've got nothing else to say further about it. When we finally make it to the end stage, we face our final set of decisions. First off, we need to defend the doors behind us. This means that everyone that I don't pick to come with me will stay behind. My heavies here are Grunt, Zaid, and Garrus, which means leaving my Krogan boy behind to defend as much as it pains me. And then for the final push, well, I bring Miranda of all people. You'll see why. And Thane. Thane's cool. We make it to the end after fighting wave after wave of these collector fuckers, where what awaits us is jarring to say the least. All of those humans being collected and siphoned has led to this, a human reaper. It's not done yet, but holy shit, what a cool concept. I know I'm fawning at this stage, but come on, I've been critical. Hell, you want more criticism? Why'd the collectors send a platform with a button that leads us directly to the human reaper? There, criticized. But yes, the reapers are basically all formed and created by absorbing the life essence of other species. It's their reproduction process, and it's how they create more of themselves. It's fucking awesome, and it explains why the Reapers are these hybrid machines of organic and inorganic material, along with the collector ships which they purpose to be these fleshy constructs. 
The final battle likewise has us shooting these tubes to cause the Reaper fetus to fall. It's a very easy battle, which there is a reason for. When you go to blow up the base here, guess who pops out of Miranda's wrist? Hey, elusive man. What? You don't think he was gonna let this place explode without a fight, did you? Nah, he wants that tech, baby. For the good of humanity. Even Miranda cuts in here and is like, uh, yeah, this isn't a good idea. So yeah, what you choose here affects Mass Effect 3 in several ways, which we'll talk about in a later video. You already know what I'm gonna do. We'll fight and win without it. I won't let fear compromise who I am. Miranda, do not let Shepard destroy the base. Or what? You'll replace me next? I gave you an order, Miranda. I noticed. Consider this my resignation. Hell yeah, girl. Finally, you get your shit together suddenly after licking Cerberus's ass all the way up here until this very moment, creating a completely different character out for you than you previously seemed like you were going down for no reason other than to create this badass moment. It definitely wouldn't have been cooler if you turned on me after all this. So yeah, the Reaper isn't dead. Here comes the Diablo 3 boss fight, baby. So this is how this boss fight goes. It is a very easy battle, which there is a reason for. Oh, never mind, I guess it's just easy. Huh, why can't these guys make good final boss battles? It is worth noting that if less than two of your companions survive the final run, Shepard will die here. It's not canon, but it is a cool alternate ending. But as things stand, the final scene has us getting the fuck out of there while the Reapers continue to whisper sweet nothings into our ears about how we haven't won. Huh, wonder if there'll be a third game. Hopefully it has a good ending and not three different buttons that do the same thing fundamentally. When we make it back to the elusive man, he's upset for some reason that I can't really place my finger on. I should have known you'd choke on the hard decisions. Too idealistic from the start. From now on, I'm doing things my way, whether you agree or not. Don't turn your back on me, Shepard. I made you, I brought you back from the dead. Joker, lose this channel. Fun fact, that star behind him will turn red if you spared the base. Red and blue if Shep died. But yeah, that's about it for the vanilla game. Shepard does one more pass through the Normandy before the scene closes with the Reapers approaching the Milky Way, setting up one of the best openings that I've ever seen in a video game via Mass Effect 3. Mass Effect 2 is basically Dragon Age Origins with guns. I typed that thinking that it would be a haha -ha funny joke, but the two games do have a lot of parallels that sprung to mind the more that I thought about it, at least from a story perspective. A threat that suddenly makes itself clear even though it's always been lurking. This same threat that used to be on the side of the living and was transformed into the enemy. A charismatic leader who has to recruit a bunch of allies to take on this threat. Allies which have their own problems and personal missions. A lot of the big story pieces have parallels, but I will say that Dragon Age had a lot more player agency. I feel like I could play that game four or five times and get a relatively unique experience with all of the options involved. Shepard, on the other hand, will always be on the elusive man's leash for as long as he is, no matter which dialogue you choose. I would say that two playthroughs would net you pretty much everything that you missed out on. Maybe three for some superfluous things. And that's not a bad thing. The game is long and there's nothing wrong with only being able to play it twice back to back before getting bored. The level design for each level is a lot less sprawling than Dragon Age also, which makes it easier to transition from set piece to set piece. There are definitely parts of Dragon Age that I really didn't care to replay from a gameplay perspective because of how clunky the game is by comparison, with long stretches of running and fighting from point to point. Mass Effect dials this back and focuses its missions a bit more, making the gameplay not bother me as much when I'm trying to move through the story. One of the biggest issues that I have with Mass Effect 2 is actually an issue that links to how Bioware writes their protagonists in general. Basically, Shepard tends to be a cardboard cutout for a large chunk of the game, only showing off personality when you choose the Personality A or Personality B options. That's not to say that he has no personality in general. 
but oftentimes he seems to lack critical thinking skills which any good protagonist would have. He'll occasionally question a decision or antagonize someone, sure, but he usually winds up going with whatever someone tells him to do anyways. It's rare to be able to outright deny a quest objective in this game. Hell, I'm not even sure if it's possible. The problem is that Bioware wants the player to be able to decide who Shepard is to them, without letting them fail quests or drastically alter their course. And maybe that isn't as much on Shepard as a character, as it is on every other character's response to him. I mean, say you choose an Intimidation Renegade option. That option works every single time if you can choose it. Maybe it pisses the person off and you punch them and they give up the info. Maybe it scares them, but it always works. I think something that fixes this system at least a little bit would be letting the player fail. Basically, speech checks. 25% to intimidate, 50% to persuade, shit like that. And if you fail, then you have to find an alternate route. The guy walks away, doesn't give up the info, and you have to kill him or trail him or find someone else. It's a little irritating to know that pretty much anything that you say is going to progress the mission. And it makes Shepard seem more like an elaborate pulley system of moving parts rather than a human when he says, hey, fuck this and fuck you. And the character that they're talking to goes, Well, yeah, but can you piss straight up in the air without getting wet, human? And Shepard goes, Shit, I, I, I can't do that. Fine, what do you want me to do? Like I said, it's a shared issue between Bioware protagonists, as Revan might have options to be a dick, but he's still gonna get the quest done, just like the Warden might. It's a lot like a D&D dungeon master having a set storyline that doesn't adapt to what its players are doing. So if a player decides to stab an important NPC in the DM's game, the DM is still gonna railroad the player towards the dragon fight which the NPC would have led them to. It's not a bad thing from a game development point of view because realistically, building a game where the player can outright refuse whole objective points is going to be extremely complicated to reroute in a way where they still wind up doing the planned end stage of the game. It's not impossible, it's just a lot harder to do without simplifying many of your main story points. So either you build your game while really finely tuning the various dialogue points and story pieces, or you focus on the quantity aspect to allow for Shepard to, say, deny collecting the Reaper IFF for two or three other options which get him into the Omega-4 Relay. And then those options might not always be as quality focused in order to get the game out without taking eight years. It's a blessing and a curse to write the way that Bioware does, as the big, shining, refined moments stand out as the bread and butter of the development team but the lesser moments fall flat and make you scratch your head about an issue which sticks out. So is Mass Effect 2 as good as I remember? Yes, for the most part. It's a tough question because a lot of those really big, bombastic moments stick out as what I really look forward to in a video game. Those top-notch ideas probably shaped what I expect from many other games which came after it and the way that it interacts with its predecessor and sequel really make the entire franchise as special as it is to me. That said, many of the smaller decisions really stuck out to me in some way or another as just odd or silly, especially with certain loyalty missions. I do think that 12 comrades is too many, and that shows when the quality drops or increases from companion to companion. It's probably the reason why they cut that amount in half for the third game while still retaining some of those characters for various integral story moments. The combat was definitely better than the first game for me, though I know that not everyone agrees with that. The level design was much better though, as wading through a level didn't have me slogging through the same kind of combat for 30 minutes, and instead kept that down while shaking things up every here and there with various enemy types. It's not a great combat system, but it really isn't bad enough for me to feel that upset about it. I just really wish that they would have allowed the player to have mission types where combat with mercs or merc-adjacent enemies wasn't a necessity, as that really started to stick out to me the more that I played. And I also really wound up missing being able to modify my weapons and armor to be the way that I wanted them to be. The lack of customization really hindered my enjoyment at times, as the streamlining process made me miss a lot of the equipment system which was presented in the first game. But all in all, I did have a very fun time. If I had to give this a personal ranking and choose between it and Dragon Age Origins, 
I still think I like the setting, writing, stats, and customization better in Dragon Age. But Mass Effect 2 does come pretty close with its story, at least. At this stage, I'm just remembering the intro of 3 and trying to forget the ending of 3. I'm excited to get to that one sometime, but I think we'll put it off until later in 2022. Thanks for watching. In no way was this ever supposed to be as long as it is. I started out confident in this being a 2.5 hour long video max, but uh, then I just kept talking. Shit. Either way, I am glad that I did it. I have no idea what's next, but The Witcher 2 is definitely going to be around the corner at some point just because that's the order that I followed before with the first games of each series. Until then though, I still have this plushy boy ready for pre-order. Again, the amount pre-ordered is going to be the amount made, so if you want it, get it. Or risk extinction for the species. I also have shirts over at my store if arming yourself with cloth is more your style. They are probably video game related last I checked. I also gotta give a special thanks to Displayed for sponsoring this video again. That was very cool of them. Feel free to check them out with my link below. Then I've got a Twitch where, um... My internet's been shit thanks to an update which was more of a down date. But uh, usually that happens every Monday, Tuesday, and Friday. I've got a Twitter where I tweet about my videos and sometimes other shit. I've got a Discord where you can chat with others in the meantime. And I've got a Patreon where I've actually recently started a small Patreon podcast in which I ramble about games that are on my mind. And that's it. Happy New Year.